uh, get closer and closer to the front because as fi people file in, it's going to get packed. Uh, so if you're in the other room, you might as well start filing into the theater because we're about to start. Thanks for being here. Tommy, are we live? Check. All right. Hey, YouTube, this is the Propelio event. Thanks for being here. Um, I've got Jason Bible. If y'all have you noticed him, he, he used to, he's out of Houston. Um, he's a big a player down in there. He's also got a show with Kayla McMahon here on Propelio TV, and he's going to be your MC moderator. Uh, his job is to keep us on track, keep us on schedule, and let us go down the flow of the path and hopefully uh, slap anybody gets salesy. Uh, so, Jason, welcome. Thanks for having me here, man. Yeah. This is great. So, first of all, take two minutes. I just said don't sell anything, but take two minutes to sell yourself. Sell myself. Uh, I'm a... Before I got into real estate, I spent 15 years as a risk manager in the biomedical uh, research and healthcare industry. In 2013, I became a full-time real estate investor, flipped 100 houses a year, and now I'm doing single family and transitioning to multifamily real estate. Cool. That's it. That didn't even take two minutes. It's great. All right. Well, let me uh, introduce. I just saw him two minutes ago. He's around here somewhere. Let me introduce our first uh, speaker for the evening, real estate investor and economist. Tyler Waldrop, if he's here. Big round of applause for Tyler, everybody. Is this on? Okay, it's on. <laughs> okay, is it on? We got you it. are good to go. Okay. What I do is just kind of the market update. Um, I'm really just going to give you guys a cool... Hold on, let me get this thing right, first of all. Boom. Is that... There. I know, I'm touching it. Okay. So basically what I do is kind of a dry, it's just the, uh, the market update of kind of what's going on in DFW. I don't know what everybody's heard, what everybody's kind of feeling. Uh, what's the general consensus? What have you guys heard? Recession, inverted yield curve, things are going down. Well, th these are basically the numbers of what's going on. And here, here are your key metrics that are always going to be important. And what this is going to show, and this is going to be the same in pretty much every market across Dallas. Dallas County, Dar uh, Denton, Tarrant, um, and Kaufman County, all of them are the same. New listings have gone up. Now, I don't know, Jason, in Houston, how, how's the market? New yeah, listings I mean, are similar? Uh, new listings are way up. I did a, a webinar last night. I want to say they were up like 13, 14 percent, something like that. Okay. So, and my point on all these key metrics are what they're showing is that supply has increased relative to demand. And I'm sure that's, again, that's across the United States. I've got some uh, basic MSA numbers here. Pending sales have gone down. Same in Houston, probably? Similar? Uh, yeah, we're still suffering the Harvey effect oh, almost yeah. two years later. So it's yeah. still, our data is still a little wonky. Give it another six or eight months, I think we'll be through before it. It's, yeah, before it normalizes a little bit. But basically, closed sales are down. So pending sales... Uh, are down, closed sales are down. Days on market have gone up to 56. So, you know, at one point in Dallas, we were seeing 19 days on market. I mean, people were snapping stuff up. So the fact that that's gone up is just, it's just a sign of a little bit of cooling. But look, if you're investing, understand that 56, that's gonna be into your holding cost. And again, in Houston, are you guys running into any of the same kind of days on market issues? Yeah, we are, and I think it's in part because uh, median home price has just gone up through the roof. Now, our days on market, actually our uh, months of supply is up to about four now. So you got, so, so normal six to nine. Yeah. So even, and what, basically what a month supply is, if you stopped selling, if you stopped right now listing any further houses, how long would it take you to liquidate all of the, all of the inventory of homes on the market? A healthy, what I'm going to say is healthy, quote unquote, market is about six to nine months. Again, in Dallas, at one point, or DFW, we were at like 1.9 months. It's up to about three months. That's still pretty good. And what were you saying? You guys were four? Yeah, we just creeped up to four. Okay, so that's, that's, still, that's still, Texas is always pretty good. Well, we are allegedly in the middle of an oil crisis down there, and I haven't seen it in the last three years. But that's what the economists claim. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, again, that's, that may have, Texas is, is a little bit of a, an anomaly with other states. Um, and again, so the supply that has increased, it's increased 24%. Um, this is basically just going into the individual counties. There's no point in going over these uh, specifically or directly. But again, inventory's up 29%. So 
44 days on market, 1.5 months. If you're, none of these things are scary to investors. It's just understanding this, putting this into your numbers. Jason, I know you, you talk a lot about that. You've got to plan. You've got to know what you're doing before you go in. You got to know your holding cost and what that's part of that is your time. Um, again, 50% increase in months supply. So that's just telling us inventory has increased relative to the amount of people demanding prices. Um, and I don't know about you, but the property tax in Dallas County is insane. They are literally trying to increase in my property 196%. 196%. Well, you're one of those evil rich landlords. You need well, to pay your tax. No, I'm talking about my house. <laughs> oh, your personal residence. My okay. personal house. Yeah, they're going up like 60% on my properties. 196, and I I'm, I'm already went to the informal. Didn't work out too well. Uh, anyway, closed sales are down. Month supplies up. Dallas County, uh, Tarrant County, which uh, Fort Worth area. Same thing. We're seeing the same thing. We're seeing, you know, days on market go up. Average list price, median price. Um, that's a little more affordable, but that's, that's still high to a lot of people. And I know, Jason, you said that too, that basically if you're under 250, that's an affordable home. That's a family that's, home. That's the new affordable house now. I mean, there's yeah. no drive across the country. I, I do a, a trip every year to the beach. We go from Houston, Texas, all the way to Pennsylvania. And I don't see even in Alabama, Mississippi, some of the most... I mean, I'm from Alabama. So okay, yeah. so some of the least expensive places on the planet, at least in the United States... And I don't see new homes being built for less than 250 grand. It's, well, it's almost the replacement cost. You almost can't, exactly. you almost can't do that. So again, th that's, that's a little more reasonable than it has been. And again, I've got some uh, MSA numbers in here. Now, Collin County, this Collin County, which is Plano, um, you know, Frisco, a little bit north, this has been where I've personally seen the most um, issues, if, if you want to say. 71 days on market. Month supply, 3.5. House prices, three three hundred thirty-seven thousand. I mean, that's a like that, that's that's a lot of money. You know, I mean that that's that's crazy. Inventory again up thirty-one percent. Closed sales down. Collin County has always been a little bit overheated, in my opinion. How much is it, is Collin County new construction? It seems like there's a lot a of lot. new construction. Up a there, lot, yeah. because there's been a, there's been a tremendous amount of. Um, development up there it's just it's it's gone crazy but there's a lot of retail development up there and so people you know live up there um denton county which is further north than collin which would be like obviously denton and uh, i believe Louisville, carrollton some of those still that, that these are these are high prices i don't know about you guys i mean y'all may be like money bags up in here but three hundred sixty-five thousand for an average house is you know i mean in alabama that's that how that house would have wings it would have like, you would have a different area code. Like you'd be like, call mama. She's in the, you know, I mean, that's, that'd be huge. So um, Denton County, again, it's, it's had a little bit of less change in closed sales. So it, it hasn't gotten as overheated. But again, days on market, 61 days. If you're an investor, that's part of your holding cost. That needs to be considered. You need to look at these information. And again, all this, guys, is free information. It's the North Texas Real Estate Information Systems. You don't have to have access to the MLS. It's there. You just type it in. It's the data. It's free. Um, that's always your best, um, your best asset is information. This is um, the DFW Metroplex compared to some other uh, metropolitan statistical areas. Just to give you kind of an idea of what we're, how, how it is in the other areas. So New York, median price. And a median would be just the middle house. If you listed all the house prices, it would be the price that's in the middle. It's not an average house price. Um, 519000 in New York, 61 days on market. Uh, Los Angeles, $834,000. And that's, that's insane. 40 days on market. Chicago, 324. DFW is actually higher than Chicago. Um, Houston, 328. And again, this is 2018 data. So... Houston, 328, uh, it's, it's higher than Chicago. 52 days on market, like you were saying, you guys are still experiencing some of that effect. Um, Philadelphia, a little under 300,000. DC, about 500,000. Miami, 506. Atlanta, 338. Um, but look at Atlanta's house price growth. 12.7%.
It, Atlanta is exploding. I don't know if you guys have been there or whatever, but it's exploding. Have you been there, Jason? Have you been to uh, Atlanta? I have not been to Atlanta, but I'm in L.A. once a month. And what's interesting about this number, when you look at year-over-year -year increase, let's say 13%, a better way to, see, to say that is appreciation. Meaning, if you have a 13% hard money loan, that's about what you're making on this house. It's so, amazing. And so what, are we, what do investors, what should investors be buying for? <clears throat> Assets. Yeah. Holding passive income, buying for appreciation. Yep. If you're buying, if you're buying houses to flip, you're buying a job. I mean, again, we that's necessary as well. Here's what I would add when you do this chart next month, because the real fascinating data mm -hmm. behind here is price per square foot. That's what blows me away. Yeah. And what you'll see is that's good. That's good. DFW yeah. and Houston about the same. Then when you compare it to Chicago and LA and New York, it's only a matter of time until these Texas markets overtake Chicago. I, that's what I'm afraid of. That, that's what, it, what I'm afraid of in one way, but it's, again... Oh, it's I, happening. It's going to happen. Well, it's happening, and again, I, I'm a big component of never fear the data. Like, if, there, if, if it was certain that we were going to have a market crash because of an inverted yield curve, guess what? If people are starting to lose their houses, how does that benefit investors? Pre-foreclosures. So it, it's always a win. Uh, never fear the data. Just embrace it and know what it is. Um, and basically, I think to summary, I don't have the summary on there, but basically it's the same thing. Look, uh, supply has increased relative to demand. Days on market is increased. The market has cooled a little bit, but there's nothing about that that should be scary. It should just be planning for it. Mm -hmm. Plan for it. Understand that it's there. Um, Data is your best friend. That's it. And like you were saying, appreciation. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to appreciate over the long run. Yeah. So... That's it. Does anyone have any questions? Did anyone see Avengers? Is that, was that a movie? I didn't see it, but I've heard of it. I'm not kidding. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, um, but that's it. That's all I've got. Jason, do you have anything else to add? No, that's Did it. Big round of applause for Tyler. I think this is fantastic. Woo. All right, so maybe you can help me out with something. Yeah. So we've got some free books we need to give away. Okay. And I don't know if we do like some kind of Q&A for the best question. We give them a trivia question, something. I think we got to do something. Come up with They've some. They've got to earn. We're all about earning around here, right? You got to earn the book. What would be a good question from the slides here? Oh, from the, oh, from the it slides. It doesn't have to be from the slides. Well, it doesn't have to be from the slides. Let's see. <clears throat> a good question would be... What was Minnie Pearl's real name? Oh, I like that. Hold on. Let me go back here. <laughs> Does anyone know who Minnie Pearl is? What was her real name? Does no one know her real name? I, I mean, I don't know it either, but no, I'm kidding. It's, her real name was Sarah Ophelia Cannon, and actually in Nashville, Tennessee, there's a Sarah Ophelia Cannon Cancer Center. She was, uh, but I can do just random trivia like that. Let's do or, it. We got some books we got to give away. That's okay. all I was told. Give away some books. <laughs> okay, who is Warren Beatty's sister that's also a famous movie star? Who? Okay, two of them. They both get it. All right, so come on green, up here, ladies. We there. just happen to have two of these. We just happen to have two Oh, books. wait, there's three of y'all. How about all three of you guys? <laughs> oh, it's the richest man in Babylon. The richest guy in Babylon. You are welcome. I'll just throw it. I'm not going to throw it. Oh, oh I'm Tell sorry. Me, it's taped, ask me. It's Let's see if I know it. Ask me. This is the VIP section right here. What's the, what's the <laughs> trivia question? All right. What's Texas Town is who from? Oh, 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 oh uh, Charlie McLean and Warren Beatty? I'm going to say Terrell, Texas, although I know they're not. They're from Waco. Who's from Terrell, Texas? What famous? Boom. What's his real name? Hold on, don't Boom. scream out. you got to raise your hand. No, I know. I'm getting it. Okay. She, she, they know it. Uh, I'm trying to think of, let's see. I don't know. How many books do you have? Is that it? That's no, I have. have a ton back there. Oh, my God. we got a whole thing. No, but i got two. I got three more here, so we can pick. Okay, we so well, let's winners. just say, uh, do you have any real estate questions? Do you have any real estate interesting questions that someone might? <sighs> um, what does MSA stand for? I just oh. said it. Oh, 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 you got to raise you your saying? hand first. What did you say? <laughs> no, no, I said not, M. That M is MSA, not NSA. M. There. Yes, oh. in the back over there, I see you right there. She said it first, Metropolitan Statistical Area. 
Let's see, where did Jason just buy four beach properties? Oh, that's a good one. Oh, you guys don't follow you my guys, Facebook, do you? You've got to watch his show. It's you gotta amazing. Watch what the day show. is it? It's uh, I, I do all Thursdays, I do all the copy for it. Days, so. I think. Yeah, yeah, I can't even remember. But you got I you guys. They're throwing one, out like we shoot them all in one day. We are, him, him and Kaylee are killing it. Oh, hey, oh, oh sorry. Your book right here. Sorry. How to make sh happen by Sean Whalen. <laughs> amazing. Thank you so much. I'm surprised much. he edited that out. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, is it the other one? Oh, sorry. Uh, I know, first host fail. Oh, come on. Uh, so I just bought uh, four beach properties in Surfside. Does anybody know where that's at? No. In Arizona. <laughs> I got some waterfront property I can sell you in Arizona. It's the other one? Oh, hold It's on. probably near Galveston. No, it's near where? There it goes. All right. San Luis... Yeah, it's just down the street from San Luis Pass. So if you go down 288 and you keep driving until your car gets wet, terminates there in Surfside. What's interesting about Surfside is that it is a beach community and is also an industrial hub. So we're buying all kinds of stuff down there. All right, well, let's give, uh, let's give Tyler a big round of applause and we will bring up our next guest. Ryan, Ryan, you're your mic is not on. It's called technology and Wi-Fi. Oh. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. All right, let me introduce uh, Troy Fullwood. Uh, he's an expert in his field. There you go. <laughs> he's an expert in his field with over 22 years' experience in the industry. Troy founded Pinnacle Investments in 1996, which has grown to be one of the nation's leaders in the purchase of first lien performing and non-performing real estate notes. Troy is recognized as one of the industry's top investment professionals and is often asked to speak at financial conferences in companies such as Harvard Business, Investor Wealth, NASDAQ, and Peak Potentials. He also contributes his ideas on real estate investing through numerous published articles and radio talk show interviews. Troy has received multiple awards throughout his career, including being voted the 2015 Best Mortgage Investor USA by Wealth and Finance International and Best of the Best in Finance by Acquisition International in 2016 and 2017. When he is not working, Troy is active in his church and assists his community and financial issues. Please welcome Troy Fullwood, everybody. Woo, Troy. All right, brother, you got 45 minutes, you're on the clock, and I get closer to you the longer you go. Okay. <laughs> I'm used to coming up here with the rocking feet, so check on that. How's everybody doing tonight? Good? First off, I want to thank, thank Propelio for having me here. I uh, flew in from Phoenix, Arizona uh, to share and impart wisdom. I know the Propelio team has done an amazing job of putting us all together. So let's first off give them a hand for what they've done. So I want to just... My mic's not on? Is that better? There we go. Oh, there we go. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right, so right out of the gate. I'm not an attorney. Um, I don't even play one on TV. Uh, and I'm not giving any kind of legal advice at all tonight. Um, what I'm here to do is to basically provide you guys with some educational aspects of what we do in the institutional space and how we raise capital. Is everybody okay with that? All right. 23 years ago, I was a landscaper in Phoenix, Arizona. It was one of those, uh, how do you say, hot jobs. And uh, we dug a lot of holes, we dug a lot of ditches, and we planted a lot of trees. Uh, with that being said, I decided one day I just didn't want to do that anymore. And because I didn't want to do it anymore, I went out looking for something to do that was different than landscaping. But I knew real, really quickly that I didn't want to do fix and flip. I didn't want to do rentals. I didn't want to do anything of that nature, primarily because fix and flipping required you to paint houses and fix up houses. Well, part of growing up as a kid for me was occasionally at school, I would get suspended. 
Now, anybody ever got suspended in school? Okay, so if you've ever been down that road, my parents were okay with me getting suspended because I would oftentimes have to paint portions of the house, AKA bedrooms, outside, inside, things of that nature. So painting connected automatically to fixing and flipping, and that was something I had no interest in doing whatsoever. I'm completely grateful, though, that my sister married a custom home painter. So I have that covered now as an adult whenever I need painting done. But with that being said, I started out getting involved in what's called the real estate note space. I started looking around at real estate. I didn't see that the fix and flip was something for me, but I wanted to be in real estate. So I picked notes. The reason I picked notes was really simple. They, the people that create loans and notes, things of that nature, are typically banks and institutions, correct? Okay. They also seem to always have the tallest building in every single city and every single metroplex in the country, which to me was rather impressive. So I wanted to figure out what they were doing. If I was going to put in the time, money, and the energy to learn something, why not go and learn what the big guys are doing? And then just copy that model and put it into play. Well, with that being said, I started wholesaling notes. I would go out and find notes. I would wholesale them to a company here in Irving, Texas called the Associates Financial Services. Unfortunately, they're no longer with us because Sandy Weil from Citicorp came in and bought them out from Ford Motor Corporation, and he dissolved the private note sector. But that's okay. We went on to do other things. Point being is that we started, I started wholesaling notes. Three years into that journey, I went out and started raising capital. Now, we didn't have private money players in the space like there are nowadays. The private money players were typically people that were mom and pops, friends and family, but they had like fifty to $100,000. That, that was not enough money for me to go out and start buying notes and holding them and building portfolios. So I went out and raised a million dollars. I raised it from a bank who gave me a line of credit that I was able to buy first lien performing residential notes and I put them on the line of credit. Now, the numbers work out really well when you're buying notes at a discount for banks and institutions to extend lines of credit because it puts their risk very, very low, their investment to value risk. That's how I got introduced to institutional money. Now, because I got in introduced to it, that's just where I stayed. So does that make sense so far? OK. So the private sector, I know, has grown dramatically over the last, I would say, 10 years as a whole. And there's a lot of great companies out there like Quest and other companies that are really helping people put their money to work. 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. People were wandering around. Their idea of putting money to work was their 401k at their job and give it off to Wall Street and let them do their thing. Well, that blew up in their face in 2007, hence why private money has probably grown in popularity because people are taking control over their financial future versus just handing it off to Wall Street. With that being said, so my first capital raise was a million dollars. I started buying notes. That capital got bigger and bigger over the period of time and ultimately got into the distressed debt space. Myself and two partners were, we built the first distressed asset fund on Wall Street back in 2007. We modeled it out. We raised $30 million in 2007, and then we proved out the model to Wall Street. Hence, at that point in time, we, then we sold the model to Wall Street, and that's where, I say, loan modifications and things like that came from, is the work that we did. Now, that being said, we've stayed in the space of building and raising institutional capital to the point where last year we raised 10 figures. Okay, So we raised $2.5 billion from two Wall Street funds, and we raised $400 million from four private equity funds for our clients and for ourselves. Now, we built a velocity model around that. Our velocity model is very straightforward. We still buy NPLs. We comb through the NPLs. We modify as many of them as we can in a 60-day period. We hold on to those. We sell the rest. We're not in the foreclosure business. We've never been in the foreclosure business. The burn rate on capital in the foreclosure side of it is astronomical. And people don't oftentimes think about that side of it. Does everybody know what the burn rate on capital is? Okay. 
Burn rate on capital is how fast you spend money. Anybody married here? <laughs> Just wanted to bring it down to a relatable level. That's a, so, so with that being said, uh, there's a photograph of me there at the New York Stock Exchange. We have uh, relationships there where we um, are tied into, so we're constantly, you know, doing what we do. Um, I'm not trying to be vague about things. I'm just trying to, how you say, communicate in a way where I want to see people in this room tonight, like grab a hold of this and go for it. Okay, that's what I want people to do. And here's what I learned. When I started raising institutional money, there was a really simple rule that was kind of, how you say, put upon me. That Wall Street's always been there. And Wall Street will always be there. The question is, are you going to go there? Because they're not going to come to you. You have to level up and go to them. Does that make sense? OK. So there's not a person in this room that can't do what I did. I just started 22 years ago and just slowly started chipping away at it. And I broke down walls of fear and things of that nature, which oftentimes people will carry around because they, quote unquote, don't like the banks. Wall Street's the bad guy. Wall Street's, Wall Street's the enemy. It's us against them. Well, I can tell you it's not us against them at the end of the day. And yeah, they've done some things that I don't necessarily agree with. And there's some things that happened during the recession that they got some bailout money. Who, would, who here would have loved some bailout money during the recession? OK. You know, they have these opportunity fund zones, which are kind of like mini bailout money games that they've now put around the country. The point being is that oftentimes we'll take up those kinds of ideas, and that keeps us from going there and doing what it is we really want to do. Okay? The only difference between all of you in this room and, my, and, and myself included and Warren Buffett is he just trades his time for a larger dollar amount. That's it. That's it. He's a bright man, but he, did, he wasn't bright when he started. He bought a furniture store. And then it grew into Berkshire Hathaway, and then it just kept growing from there. He didn't start where he's at. Does that make sense? OK. So that was my journey to Wall Street with a few bumps along the way. What is institutional money? Well, easily explained, it's borrowing money from the following institutions, banks, hedge funds, endowments, insurance companies, pension plans, Wall Street REITs, and family offices. OK. Does everybody under, know what these are? Have you guys heard of things like family offices and stuff like that? OK. So here's a great intro into institutional money. Family offices are, how do you say, private equity funds that manage very wealthy families' money around the world, all over the world. There's 20,000 family office is around the world. And what they're doing is they'll appoint a hedge fund manager or a private equity fund manager. Sometimes there's hedge funds, sometimes there's private equity funds. Um, they'll appoint somebody. And then that family will give them $2 billion, $3 billion, $4 billion, $5 billion to now go and deploy into various industries. Sometimes it's tech. Sometimes it's medical, sometimes it's pharmaceutical, sometimes it's development, sometimes it's hospitality, sometimes it's SFR, sometimes it's debt. See my point? And that's all based on the marching orders of the family. Does that make sense? Okay. That's the way all of these work. And the reason I share that with you is it's key to, how do you say, matching yourself up with the, the right money. Oftentimes, people will call me and they'll say, Troy, I tried to pitch this group and they didn't take my deal and I can't figure out why. And then I'll research the group and I'm like, they have nothing, they have zero interest in real estate. They're about medical, they're about in technology, they're about, the, they're about everything but real estate. So, of course, they're going to tell you no. And then the person can't figure it out. So, they're not matching themselves up right. That's 90%. That's, that's a good portion of what creates success in the institutional space. Okay? 
So family offices are a great place to raise capital. One, because they're very approachable. When you get into the Wall Street players, that's a whole nother game at the end of the day. That's a whole nother game. It's not a game that can't be accomplished or taken over or, how do you say, win at, but it's a completely different game. You have to have a track record. You have to, you have, to have a team in place. You have to have certain things around you. You have to spend money. The first time we raised $30 million, it cost me $185,000 just in legal work to put the fund together. Just in legal work. 185 grand. Who would, who would spend 185 grand to have access to 30 million? Yeah, every one of you. Absolutely. So to me, it was a good play. But when you look at putting together funds today, you can put them together for $40,000, $50,000 all day long. Start with the end in mind. I say this because oftentimes people come to me and they'll say, Troy, Troy, I just heard this great pr presentation on real estate, and I'm going to get into real estate now, and I'm so excited, and I just can't wait to get started. I'm like, that's fantastic. What's your plan? Well, I don't know. I'm going to keep reading some blogs, and I'm going to keep listening to some YouTube things. Okay, cool. And there's nothing wrong with that, but after you've listened to all that, figure out what your lane is. Like, I had to figure out what my lane is. I knew from childhood experiences, what I would refer to as childhood abuse. <laughs> if my mom was here, she'd call, like, BS on that. Um, <laughs> um, that I did not want to paint. And rehabbing houses was part of painting. And I didn't want to do that. Or painting houses or painting was part of rehabbing houses. I didn't want to do that. So that was immediately off the list. I didn't care if you were making $50,000 a day rehabbing houses. I had zero interest in that whatsoever. My wife today is like, can we go and buy a house and rehab it? I'm like, we? <laughs> you know, you can do that. And now she's like jumping for joy because her parents just bought a house last Friday and they want to remodel it. And I'm like, sweetie, have fun. She's like, do you want to help? And I'm like, no, I'm going to Dallas. <laughs> And so, and so the beauty of it is, is that always work with the end in mind. It doesn't matter what you want to do in this space. There's so much opportunity. And you may be standing, be sitting, standing there right now or sitting there right now going, I don't know where that's at. I don't know what that looks like. Great. You're on step one. You're on step one. I didn't know what notes looked like when I started. I couldn't tell you the difference between a note and a deed of trust if it hit me upside the head. I had to figure it out. But I knew that was the direction I wanted to go because the biggest bank building, the biggest buildings in the, in the city were banks. I'm like, they got the money. That's what I want. Do you realize that banks could put every single one of you out of business today? You want to know why they don't? Simple. They don't like rehabbing. They don't like rehabbing houses. If you don't believe me, look at their REO list. When you buy a house from an REO, off of an REO list from a bank, what do they do? Minimal cleanup. That's really about it. They might fix a few little things, but that's not their gig. They'd much rather just deploy capital, collect their payment, let you go and do whatever you want to do, which is actually a, a brilliant model, by the way. Don't get me wrong, I'm not beating up on the model. I'm just telling you the difference between the two. And they let you go out and earn your living that way. And they're more than happy to collect your money. And then when you sell the house and make 50, 60, 80, $100,000, or you build up an, an, an equity position in properties, you get to keep that as long as you make your payments. That makes sense? Yeah. OK. To give you an idea how big the banking industry is, in the mortgage side of it, just in the lending side of it. And you can look it on, you can go to like gov.gov gov or one of those sites. And it's a $10 trillion industry. Just residential mortgage lending, $10 trillion. The seller finance side of the business is a $1.7 trillion industry. Right now, the NPL space, which is non-performing loan space, there's currently about 400 million in shadow inventory that they're not even talking about right now, that they're slowly siphoning out or draining out into various buyers in the marketplace. The REO space 
is about two billion. And you see people all day long making tons of money in the REO space, right? Some of you are like, no, I haven't found a deal yet. <laughs> it's out there. It truly is. So start with the end in mind. Work backwards. Build your model in the form of a pitch deck, AKA prospectus. <clears throat> now, we're putting up a sample pitch deck on the Propelio, the, the uh, we just did a live today with uh, Ryan and Casey, and we talked about it. So I sent that over. He's going to put that up on today's episode. So if you go there, you can download a sample pitch deck. Okay, It's a Word doc. You can customize it. You can put in all your information. Here's why I will not give you a fully built one. Number one, there's confidentiality agreements that we have signed, so we can't give those things away. But number two, you got to come up with your own idea. It's your business. It's your business. I just gave you statistically numbers of how big your business can be. The question is, are you going to are you going to think at this level, or are you going to think at this level, as a whole? Does that make sense? Okay. I'm not trying to beat anybody up, but I'm just telling you, it's unlimited for you. So build out your pitch deck. If how many of you are great writers in here? How many of you don't like writing? Okay. I'll raise my hand on that group. So when I wrote my pitch deck, I basically went through, I outlined my pitch deck, and I then gave it to somebody to clean it up and write it better than I could. Here's what you want to put in your pitch deck. You want to identify the problem. What's the problem? OK? We talked about, just before I got up here, you guys showing statistically what's the trends in the DFW area compared to other areas of the country. You may be, say, in outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, and you see that there's an opportunity there. So you identify the problem. Then you back it up with statistics. Then you come in and you solve the problem. How are you going to solve it versus somebody else? I'll stand out of the way. Do you guys want me in the picture or out of the picture? I'll let you guys choose. Um, so solve the problem. How are you going to solve the problem? What makes you better than the next person? You want to know what makes you better? One thing, action. That's it. That's it. Really. I want to touch on something right there. There's this team here in Dallas called the Dallas Cowboys. OK. Now, I'm not here to pick on Dallas Cowboys. But here's what's going to happen come August. These guys are starting to practice. They're going to be doing their two-a-days in June and July, and they're going to start strength training, all those things. As a matter of fact, every NFL team in the country is going to be doing the same thing. And they're going to be focusing on this playbook that they have. And everybody's going to be learning the plays. They're going to be perfecting the plays. Then they're going to go out on Sunday afternoon, and they're going to be playing their opponent. And they're going to line up for whatever play that the quarterback just called. And the minute they snap the ball, the play is a broken play. Every single one of them is. Now, that's not, an indi that's not a characteristic of Dallas being a bad team, because guess what? The defensive team, they've got a broken play, too. But at the end of the day, they still figure out a way to advance the ball down the road. That's real estate. You put together your perfect little business plan, your perfect numbers, calculations, you buy the house, next thing you realize, you know, there's a termite problem. There's a pier and beam problem. You gotta put on a new roof all of a sudden. You gotta change out the electrical, the plumbing, things of that nature. That ever happened to anybody in here? Yeah, same thing with us in notes. We'll buy a note, the payer's paying great for two years before I buy it, six months after I buy it, they quit paying. Now I gotta contend with that. That's a broken play in our business. But it doesn't stop us from building our business. We just overcome that. That's what entrepreneurs do. That's what entrepreneurs do. Outline the risk versus reward. The number one thing that I see in people's business plans is they don't want to talk about the bad side of the business. That's a big red flag for institutional money. 
If all you're doing is telling them all the great stuff and that you're going to run a perfect game and a perfect show and a perfect business, they will pick up on that very quickly. So you have to tell them what's the downside, what's the risk. And when this happens, here's what I'm going to do, a.k.a. quarterback, Dallas Cowboys, Sunday afternoon. When this play is broken, here's what I'm going to do. Here's my plan B to advance the ball. Positioning analysis. How are you going to position yourself in the market? Who's your competition? What are they doing versus what you're doing? Case studies. Do you have case studies? Put some case studies in there. Even the ones that lost you money. If you lost money but you still paid back your investors, that's, a credit, that's, a, that's speaking to your character. They want to see that. Hey, this is one that, man, we just missed the boat altogether here. And talk about that. And then your team. Who's your team? Your team should consist of you, any business partners, legal counsel, accountants, title companies, appraisers, just to name a few. And you should have their picture, their bio in there. You can add one more. Testimonials from people that you've done business with. Character references in there as a whole. When you put it all together and it's rough and it's kind of bulky and stuff like that, then send it to somebody to work their magic. Go to Fiverr, go to iWriter.com, pay somebody two, three, four hundred bucks. You're trying to raise a million, and if you're tight fisted about 200 bucks, you just shot yourself. Does that make sense? Everybody good over there? All right. Then use the prospectus to build out an executive summary, okay? A, pr a prospectus will be probably anywhere between 10 to 20 pages long. They can go longer. They don't need to be. But then, then come in and do an executive summary. In other words, highlight things. Why do I say to highlight things? Because that's what you're going to lead with when you're raising capital and you're talking to, to potential investors. They don't want to read your 20, 30, 40 page business plan unless they're interested in you and what you're talking about. Anybody ever had to listen to somebody they're not really interested in? Not me, of course, but <laughs> somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. The same thing. These are folks that are operating and they're controlling and overseeing billions and billions of dollars a day in transactions. And if you can't summarize things for them, and bullet point things for them to get their attention, to see if they're even interested in it, then they'll just say no. And it's not because you did a poor job in writing your business plan, it's because they don't have the time. Does that make sense? All right, three to five pages. Raising capital is 10% data and 90% relationship. Okay, now I just talked about the mechanics of this, the mechanics of putting something together. And that's oftentimes what people want to talk about. They want to talk about how to, how to actually do this. What does this look like? Well, if I went into the nitty gritty of building out a business plan, it'd literally be like a three day workshop and hitting on all the different points. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that to, to, to take something from you. I'm just saying that we can get real granular in that. But I wanted to spend this time, this limited time that we have together and focus more on what I have seen to be the biggest asset in raising capital. Last year, I raised a billion dollars driving down the Pacific Coast Highway in a Ferrari. No kidding. No kidding. A, a dear friend of mine, he's the number one private wealth manager at Morgan Stanley. I was in Dana Point speaking, and he knew, I text him, I said, hey, I'm in town. He's like, great, let's do lunch. I said, great. So he comes and picks me up at the hotel in his Ferrari. He was dressed in a baseball hat, flip-flops, shorts, and a T-shirt. His office, his home office is in Boston. He lives in Dana Point, California. He lives on a 10-acre ranch. His, how do you say, hobby is growing fruit trees and working in his yard. He's about 38 years old, so he's young. Graduated from Harvard and MIT. 
just a brilliant mind and just down to earth. His wife is one of those international Pilates instructor things, does her thing. Point being is that when we were driving down the PCH, headed to go have fish tacos, real gourmet lunch there. See, and I share that with you guys because oftentimes people think we got to go to like Morton's or Bob's Steakhouse or something like that to, to impress. These guys don't give a flying rat's behind about that stuff. They just don't. They want to see who they're dealing with. They want to they know, like, and trust you. That's what they want. Does that make sense? So as we're driving down the PCH, I tell them what I just did two weeks earlier. And I raised $1.5 billion from Goldman Sachs. And they said, well, I went in on that deal. I said, well, what are you talking about? He says, I got $12 billion sitting on the sidelines right now. I've got to put it in play. I'll give you a billion of it to go play. I said, well, do you get along with Goldman Sachs? Because I don't have time to referee any adolescent behavior. <laughs> and this is how we're having this conversation, like him and I, like just straight up. And he says, yeah, we get along great. We've got a lot of deals going on. I said, perfect. He goes, what's your term sheet with Goldman? I said, are you going to match it or are you going to beat it? He goes, I'll match it. I said, okay, it's a good, go it's a good term sheet. He says, send it over to me. We'll, we'll write one up. Within the matter of a 20-minute drive to go get fish tacos for $9.97, which I paid for, by the way, um, <laughs> I figured it was only fair being so he drove, you know, type thing. Um, you know, <laughs> going back to like dating days and stuff like that. Um, and we put it together because it was all about the relationship. I spend every Christmas between anywhere between five to $10,000 on Christmas gifts going out to my Rolodex of people, my very close Rolodex of people. Why? Because it maintains the relationship as a whole. I know exactly what every single one of the people that I'm in a relationship with Wall Street, what they like. You saw the picture of me on New York Stock Exchange. My friend is the vice president of the New York Stock Exchange. When I go to the New York, I'll oftentimes ring him up and we'll go do breakfast inside the restaurant inside of the New York Stock Exchange. And we'll sit down and chat. You want to know what we talk about? His 19-year-old son who he can't get off the couch to go to work. And even though he offers to pay him $50 an hour cash, he can't figure out how to motivate him. And we talk about that because I've got four boys. And so we talk about those types of things. His hobby is buying houses that were, that were damaged by Hurricane Sandy and fixing them up and selling them. He also happens to own a whiskey company that I invested in, even though I don't drink. I've never tasted his whiskey. I've sat there and watched him drink it, but I invested in it with him. From what I understand, it's pretty good. So, but it's all about that relationship. It's all about that connection. See, because if I can connect at that level, the real personal level, then when I need something or he needs something from me, we, we have each other on speed dial, on our cell phones. My cell phone is worth no less than $10 billion. No less. So don't even try and take it because I will tackle you so fast. <laughs> and I say that because that's the value of the relationships. Does that make sense? I have a very small circle. My circle's small because my circle's strong. I don't have a big circle. Does that make sense? Build your circle. And then once you build it, then go build another one on top of that. And then build another one on top of that. Keep scaling up. And then the people that want to go with you, bring them up with you. People that want to go in a different direction, pray for them and wish them the best. But keep that relationship aspect alive and well. Even if it's just text messaging. A friend of mine who runs the trade desk at Morgan Stanley, another friend. Um, he happens to be a U of A graduate. I'm an ASU dropout. I lasted one semester at ASU. And I wrote a case study 
for a business management teacher, and the business management teacher gave me an F on the case study because they said it wasn't textbook. I said, no, it's called real world. There's a difference. And he wouldn't change the grade, and he wanted to hold me to that. And at the time, I was working in the landscaping business, and my client base was all, because it's a luxury item, at the time it was a luxury item, um, my clients were entrepreneurs. They were business owners. And I was getting constantly mentored by them. And so when this $60,000 a year professor told me I didn't do a good job, but I've got million dollar entrepreneurs speaking into me, I knew that it was time to go the other direction. And I did that not because the professor was doing anything wrong or poor or anything like that. It was that I was never going to learn how to be successful in business by being taught by a $60,000 a year professor. Professor. Now, if you guys are teachers in here, don't get me wrong, I love teachers. My mom was a teacher for years. She's an entrepreneur nowadays. She's got four college degrees. My dad has zero college degrees. I've asked my dad several times, why didn't you go to college? He says, because they don't teach common sense in college. So I've got the best of both worlds. So make sure that you build those relationships. Build the relationship before you ask them for something. How many of you hate it when somebody calls you and they haven't talked to you in six months and now all of a sudden they need something? They didn't even send you a Christmas card. And now all of a sudden there's an emergency that you've got to go and help them. You see the connection? Yeah, yeah, that's the connection. That's your million dollar connection. When you can dial that in, that'll open up doors that you wouldn't believe. Bring value to them first. Reverse engineer the relationship. I don't ever ask Wall Street, anybody on Wall Street for money unless I bring value first. What's value? Well, the first time I started going after the Wall Street guys, I started asking them what it was they wanted. Like, what are they investing in? Well, we're looking for apartment complexes. What kind of apartment complexes? Well, we've got all this money to spend. We need big apartment complexes. Great. So I started looking for apartment complexes, uh, medical centers, hospitals, um, shopping centers, development projects, and things of that nature. And I would just send them to them. Hey, guys, I found this apartment complex. I think it'll work well in your matrix. Here's the contact information for the seller. You know, let me know if you need any other help. You guys see what I just did? I took myself out of the deal. I didn't care about getting paid. I didn't care about getting a $10,000 check or a $100,000 check. I'm playing for $500 million. You can keep your 100 grand. Give me my 500 million. Give me my 50 million. Give me my 30 million. You want to know how we lined up the 30 million? That particular company, one of their focuses was lease agreements on cargo ships and oil tankers. So I went out and I found them some cargo ships and oil tankers that they could buy and lease out to other industries or other, that was their model. But the two head guys of the firm, they were hard money lenders back in their, how do you say, lending days, which were like 10 years earlier. So they understood the model and they were very, how do you say, forward thinking people. So I went out and made them money first, and then I asked them for money second. Make sense? Yeah. Reverse engineer your efforts. Who cares about the commission? Who cares about the 10 grand? Who cares about the 20 grand? Who cares about it? If you're playing at a bigger level, it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. But oftentimes, people will get so focused on that 20 grand that that's all they ever make. You know how many calls I take from people that want something but don't give anything? Zero. Zero. If I get on the phone with somebody and they're asking and asking and asking and taking and taking and taking, I introduce them to this person in my office called Tone. <laughs> He's a pretty quiet guy, but he sure sends a pretty clear message. Click. Why? Because it's not a healthy relationship. It's not a healthy relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, guess what? All the guys on Wall Street, they get that. They learned that years ago. So if you're just coming in and taking, 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 and you're not giving anything, they're just like, they'll quit taking your calls. 
and that all of a sudden just shuts down your floodgates. So lead with value first. Start marketing to institutions that match up with your idea, say commercial to commercial. An institution that invest in commercial, if you're interested in commercial, it's a match. If you're in a multifamily and they're lending on multifamily or they're putting together funds and capital, it's a match. If they're in SFR and you're in SFR, it's a match. But the biggest mistake most people do is they don't go and take time to find out what that institution's doing. You know that not all banks lend on real estate? Out of the 7,800 banks in this country, the, yes, there's 7,800 of them in this country. And I'm not talking locations. I'm talking B of A would be one. Wells would be two. 7,800 different banks around the country. They all have their own unique management style and their portfolio focus. And if you're talking to a bank and you're trying to get money out of them and they're not interested in real estate because they're more SBA lenders or maybe they're student loan lenders, whatever it may be, that's their niche because that's the management team's characteristics and that's what they put together, that's what they raise capital based on, then you're just beating your head against the door. But you'll, here's what often happens. People will go and do that and then they'll give up. Well, they don't give up. You're just knocking on the wrong door. Does that make sense? All right. You guys good? Nobody falling asleep? All right. Now's the time to market your opportunity to the institutions. Um, institutions in general, like I said, you've got to have that connection. And keep in mind that some of you that are dealing in, like, how you say, smaller markets that have, like, community banks and stuff like that, build relationships with those bankers. How many of you have ever taken a banker to lunch or breakfast? Okay. Yeah. So like 2% of the room, 3% of the room, the rest of you are missing out on huge opportunities. Huge opportunities. And you don't even know what you're missing. How many of you have a personal banker that calls up and then watches your money for you? That's pretty cool stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because you built the relationships. You put, you put the time in. Guess, guess what it takes to do that? A lunch or two. You're eating lunch anyways. You're eating breakfast anyways. They, wanna, they, they want to know who their clientele is, but they're not necessarily going to pursue you. You have to pursue them. So buy them a hot dog. Buy them a slice of pizza, whatever it is they want to do. Go do that. And then be loyal to them. Because they'll be loyal to you. You have a mistake in your account, your account gets you know, whacked. I've had things where wires have gone out and wires didn't come in and this is happening, that's happening. No big deal. They cover it. They make sure things go right. I've had bankers leave locations and all of a sudden I walk in there and now there's a new banker. I'm like, where's Russ? He's like, well, Russ got moved over here. I'm like, good, here's what I need to do, this, this, and this. And he's like, well, I need to kind of think about this. I'm like, call Russ, he'll take care of it. Or tell me where Russ is at, and then I'll go over there and get it handled. Next thing you know, 20 minutes later, it's handled. Are we almost wrapping up here, Jason? Four minutes, awesome. So if you need a list of institutional investors, we maintain one of about 900. Um, and we can chat after the event. Um, using family offices platform is a great place to start raising capital. Okay, here's their website, www.familyoffices.com. Richard runs it. You want me in the picture? Or I can, I can just like do this. <laughs> um, go out to familyoffices.com. Uh, Richard runs that whole monster and um, matter of fact, they are having an event here in Dallas this weekend or next weekend on capital raising. Pretty cool stuff. They have like nine, ten events all over the country. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at troy at pinnacleinvestments.com. Call our office at 480-831-5067. FYI, if you send me an email and I don't respond within 48 hours, I did not get it. 
Just being really clear, we have filters on our email systems which cut down on the junk email. Any of you guys get junk email? Okay, so if I didn't respond in 48 hours, I didn't get it. That's my story, so I'm sticking to that. Um, but actually, if you send one, you'll get a spam arrest. You need to click on the link. It'll go through, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. All right, it's not that I'm ignoring you. It's not that I'm being, you know, don't like you kind of thing. It's just what it is. All right, good? Can we, can we get a big round of applause for Troy? <laughs> can, we, can we get you for one or two questions? Yeah. Anybody got one or two questions out there? Yes, sir. Like when you say partnership, like you and a business partner going out to raise capital together? Oh, I, I can tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the ugly part, um, I'll start there. I had an old business partner. Actually, it was on the first fund that we did. And about six months into the business relationship, I found out that his cousin was Jeffrey Dahmer. Boy, that's a few of you have been watching the news. Um, <laughs> so that was a big, like, uh-uh. So even doing a background check on him, which we all did as a partner, which I would recommend, if you're going into business with somebody, just get it out of the way. Hire a company, do a background check on each of you, and share. And get the skeletons out of the closet. We all have them. We've all made mistakes. We've all grown up. We've all matured, yada, yada, yada. At the end of the day, do those types of things. Make sure that you and your partners always have a synergy and that you're wanting to go in the same direction. If you don't, like case in point, you have somebody that's really good at data or really good at, how you say, calculating things, but they don't want to really grow the company. They just want to get to like 10 million or something like that, and that's their comfort zone. Pushing them beyond that is going to be like pulling, you know, pushing a rope up a hill. So make sure that you take time to do that before you get in business with them because they'll tie, they'll tie up your assets and legal fees and stuff like that. One more? I've been associated with Troy for several years. Came from some other people that we both know in, uh, together. And all I can say is the Troy you see right here is the Troy that there is. If you ask him a question or you come to him with something, and he isn't behind it or he thinks it's stupid, he's going to tell you that. <laughs> he's not going to be something about, well, no, now I've got this other course, you need to buy that so you know the answer to that. <laughs> but the Troy you see right here is the Troy there is. And like I say, if you can't stand somebody telling you the straight skinny, don't talk to Troy. <laughs> and on that real quick, just Thanks, because <laughs> Tommy and I were talking about this in the studio earlier, it's like, you know, he is so sweet and so nice and so fun and so loving. It's like, when you got access to that many billions of dollars, you'd probably be nice and sweet and fun too, right? <laughs> I don't think I would have two cares in the world. It's like, how much money I got? <laughs> is there another question here? Any questions? Cool. Everybody good? All right, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Excellent job. Troy. All right. We're going to get started here. Corey Peterson is the owner of Kahuna Investments. Corey strives to provide his investors with stable cash flow, returns, and long-term capital pre appreciation by buying multifamily apartments. Corey has managed and acquired over $95 million in real estate across the country. He is the best-selling author, author of Why the Rich Get Richer, The Secrets to Cash Flowing Apartments, and host of the Multifamily Legacy Podcast. He speaks around the country on the subject, including at Harvard and NASDAQ. Corey is frequently featured on Fox, CBS, ABC, and NBC affiliates. Please welcome Corey Peterson. How is everybody doing? All right, I got my clicker in the hand. We're good. Cool. Hey, I'm really honored to be here today. I'm Yep, go ahead. Real quick, Corey, I, sorry to interrupt. If, you're, if, if we could do like two seconds of house cleaning, if you're in the back or in the middle, can you all stand up and come closer? Uh, because as we get going, as Corey keeps going, more people are going to want to funnel in. So all the good please stuff, all stand the good up and move towards the front. I'm going to give it to you like no. no it's just like church. None. Let's get Nobody? up move up. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Sorry, Corey. I'm just yeah, trying no to help worries. you out, man. Cool. Yeah. 
all the good stuff right here at the front, all the good, all the good guys that want to really learn uh, what I'm going to teach, because we're going to talk, this whole, uh, today is all about private capital, and I'm going to show you my story of how uh, we've raised a crap ton of money, and I think you'll enjoy it, because I think it's uh, to the point, um, and and so I live it and breathe it each and every day. And so with that said, I like to just kind of just get started and tell you guys my story. So, you know, I like to say, um, you know, I, I've done a lot of success. I've had a lot of success in real estate, but um, it, did, it wasn't always that way. I, I would like to say I started like this picture here um, in a nice house, you know, with, um, you know, wealthy parents and, and, you know, lots of, you know, that, that silver spoon. Does anybody want a silver spoon? Wish they had a silver spoon. I know I did. Um, but that's not where I started, okay? I, I started right here uh, in West Plains, Missouri, in the Ozarks. And if you guys don't know anything about the Ozarks, um, you know, just watch the Ozarks on Netflix, okay? <laughs> but, you know, growing up on a farm, you know, what I learned on a farm is you've got to, you dream a lot, Right, because there's not a lot of people that you can go play with, and so you got to go into your mind and dream. And on this farm, I dreamed, and I dreamed big. See, I had plans, I had goals. I, I wanted to be somebody, you know. And the question in my mind was, how do I get there? How do I become somebody that you know is successful? But I'm starting from here, right? And so now, isn't it funny? Because you know, when I was young and a kid. Um, when we were kids, you guys remember this, that you dreamt that you could be or do anything? You guys remember that feeling, right? Why is it that when we get older, right, things start to change? We, we don't really understand why they change, but people start saying, you can't do that. You're good, not good enough. Uh, you'll never succeed. Has anybody ever had any of those types of, types of self-talk? Because I, I know I did, right? In fact, it became real relevant to me in my seventh grade year when my teacher was asking, hey, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? He was pulling the classroom. So I raised my hand, and sure enough, he picked me. Now, not only was he my teacher, but he was my coach. And I was, at the time, one of his star athletes. And, you know, you may not see it now, but back in the day, right? And so I'm raising my hands, you know, and, I, and, and so he picks me, and I, I walk all the way to the front of the room. And I proudly proclaim that I want to be a professional baseball, baseball player, right? Just like my dad. My dad had got drafted out of high school into the Cleveland Indians, right? And that's where I wanted to be, man. And I had hidden this secret. I had not shared it with anybody. It was mine. And I was ready to like let it out to the world. And I say this to the class in the front of the room. And I'm telling you, as soon as I said those words, my teacher looked me squarely in the eyes and he said, based upon the odds, that will never happen. As a young seven-year-old, young adult, right, I, I remember, like, I was like, wait, w wait, you know, in my, in my mind, like, no. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, my head went down and my shoulders shrunk. And I walked all the way back to my, my seat and I sat there. And, and doubt started rushing in and, and it was the first time in my life that I told myself, well, but may maybe, maybe, maybe I'm not good enough, right? Has anybody had that? Now, as I've gotten older in life and I've learned some things, right? I learn. Now, I love that. Before you get hating on my teacher, and my coach, right? I realized something, right? What I told him, see, my dream was way bigger than his that he had for me, right? Isn't that what happens in life, right? Sometimes you have big dreams that people, crab theory, they want to pull you down and keep you there, right? I had big dreams for myself, yet my teacher didn't see them. And all he saw was a kid running full speed ahead towards a cliff. And all he saw was the pain. All he saw was the pain. But I'm telling you right now, as you guys are sitting in these seats, pain is where growth happens. It's just a fact of life, folks you got to deal with it, right? If you're not willing to fail once or a thousand times to be successful, I promise you, you'll never be it. I promise you. That's the truth. Can I get an amen? amen. And I'm not preaching here, but I'm going to tell you some stuff that will um, radically change your life today. And I'm telling you, because it's changed mine, 
right? Can I share that with you guys? Let's get started, man. So for me, 17 years ago, my life changed forever, right? So, you know, when you don't, I barely met out of high school. I don't know about you guys, I barely met out of high school, right? And when you don't get a college degree, you got to manage some crap or you got to sell some crap. I sold used cars, okay? I was that guy. Until my wife said, my girlfriend at the time said she couldn't marry a car salesman. So then I became a restaurant manager. <laughs> I moved up. I got a steady paycheck. <laughs> but uh, I was 32 years old. It's actually almost 18 years now. Something radically changed. It changed my life forever. Um, my mom was married to a man named Bruce. Now, I call him Bruce Wayne. Okay? He wasn't Batman. But he was loaded. And Bruce had a house in Hawaii. And so one day, my mom, married to Bruce, looks at me and my girlfriend, now my wife, 17 years. She says, you know, do you guys want to go to Hawaii? We're like, oh my God, are you paying? But if you are, yes, right? So when we get there, would you know it that Bruce has a house right on the beach? Right on the beach. And I'm telling you, I mean, this is my first real big vacation, and we're, we go there. I remember waking up early in the morning, because you wake up early when you get to Hawaii, right? And uh, we go, and our, our toes are in the water. We walk this cove, right? We walk, oops, crap. We walk this cove, okay? And when we get here, like right here, there's a river that runs from the mountains above, you know, in, into the ocean. It was just magical. We, I keep walking the, the, the pier, and then the sun starts to rise. And I remember Shelly and I standing hand in hand as we watched as the spray from the waves was creating like a little spray and, and the light hit it from the sun coming up. And dude, it was like magical paradise. And we just sat there for about 15 minutes, hand in hand. And we were, you know, it was like we were being transformed. And I remember looking all the way over and seeing Bruce's house. And I was like, man, what does this guy do? See, because Bruce had fine cars, nice art in the house. Um, his phone was not ringing. See, he had a lifestyle, right? He had time and money, right? And I saw, I was like, so Bruce, what do you do? Guess what he said, right? He said he did real estate and that he owned apartment complexes. Now, I wish the story got better, but it doesn't because Bruce was a prick, okay? <laughs> He was never going to teach me real estate, but it didn't matter. It's okay, right? Because really, Bruce did give me my first thing that I really learned that I think most of us are looking for. He gave me the perfect picture of the two things that I think that most of us in this room are striving for, time and money, right? Time and money. Give me some time to spend some of my money. I want a full life. And he had it perfect. And so I left the island thinking, man, Bruce is the big kahuna, right? Now, four months later, I read this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, 2004, right? And all I could do was like, that's Bruce, that's Bruce. And so uh, in 2005, I started my company and I called it Kahuna Investments because I wanted to be the big kahuna just like Bruce, right? And I went on a journey in 2005 to start my real estate career. Um, it wasn't easy, okay? I started off as a wholesaler. Why a wholesaler? Because I had no money and no freaking credit, and I, you know, like, where do you start, right? And I started wholesaling deals. Then something magical, I'm gonna tell you something magical that changed my life forever, but I got really good at, well, I'll tell you now, I got, I got really good at raising capital, private money, okay? Started doing single family fixed and flips to where, 2011, I bought my first apartment complex. I bought it for $3.2 million, and I raised $1.4 million of private money. Is that cool? Now, here's what's really cool. I sold that property two years ago. I held it for five years. I, you know, kept collecting the rents, cash flowing, okay? This is my HUD. What did I make when I sold it? I sold it for $8.8 .8 million dollars, right? Can I get a hell yeah? yeah? Hell yeah, right? Wouldn't you like to make some of that? Hell yeah, right? And guys, 
it started from learning one simple thing, right? So when I look back at my life and my career and like, if I could say, Corey, you know, when did the fork in the road happen? Like, when did things really change for you, right? For me, it happened at this point in time where I learned something magical, right? So when I was wholesaling, you know, this is back when we we're doing REOs and short sales on the MLS. You guys remember those days, right? REOs and short sales. There was no marketing for deals, at least that, not that I knew of. So I'm doing deals, I'm wholesaling, I'm in the game, I'm going to RIAs or events like this, finding all the rich kids or rich people and saying, hey, where do you like to buy your stuff at, right? Like I, buy, I find shit just like that every day, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm taking orders, right? I, I find, I'm a wholesaler, I can hook you up, bro, right? That's how I'm doing it, man, right? I'm just hustling. But I was like, gosh dang it, if I could just find some capital, because they were making 25 or $30,000 rips, and here I'm making a $3,000 wholesaling fee. That sucks, right? But hey, listen, it was, I was making a living because I was doing three or four a month. That's not bad. And I'm in the game. I'm doing real estate. I'm feeling, I'm getting confident, right? Start building up my confidence because that's what it takes, right? Confidence, extreme confidence to get crap done, right? So I'm, I'm in the game of real estate, and then this happens. Now, I'm going to back up for a second. Before I got into real estate, I was a financial advisor, okay? I actually transformed from a used car salesman to a restaurant manager, and then when I found out that you didn't have to have a, a college degree to be a financial advisor, I'm like, hell, what do I got to do? They said, you just got to pass a test. I'm like, hell, give me that test, man. I'll study the shit on that thing, right? <laughs> and I passed with a 73. <laughs> But I learned all about money. I learned how to find money, where, how to talk about cash. That's what Edward Jones taught me, was the game of talking with everyday people and putting yourself in positions to talk about money. My job was to talk about money, right? And do we talk about money at home? Hell no. Right? Do we? Hell no. But rich people do. People with money do. Right? All the time. And so here I am, I had, a, I had a, an ex-client that I played, the reason this is up here, because we played racquetball together. In fact, his name's Carl, and me and Carl still play. We just played uh, yesterday, in fact, right? And he actually, he's 69, and he still won a game for me, okay? So we played three games, and he won one. So he's pretty fit little fiddle. But I'm talking to Carl. Me and Carl are racquetball friends, and I'm like, hey, Carl, man, you're watching me wholesale. And I'm making a living. I said, man, but you live in this retirement. Now, the thing about Carl, Carl didn't have any extra money that I knew of. I was his advisor when he, when he was at Edward Jones. And I was like, Carl didn't have any extra money. So I wasn't asking Carl for his money. Carl lived in a retirement community. And I'm like, man, surely there's got to be someone in that retirement community that has some money. Right? So I'm asking them. I'm just asking for, Carl, you watch me do this, making $3,000 deals, and my investors are making $25,000 rips. I just want to flip the script. Right? I want to make the twenty-five, dollars pay the three dollars to $5,000 in interest, give you a note and deed of trust. Do you know anybody? Right? That's all, and that's how it was. And so he's like, well, I'll see what I can do. Well, the next day, guess who calls me? It's Carl. He's like, hey, Corey. Do you still want to do, you know, that 12% that you were talking about? I was like, well, yeah. In the back of my mind, I was like, man, Carl found somebody, right? And he, he goes, Corey, well, you don't know this, but my home is totally paid for. I can borrow money at 3%. If you give me 12, I can make a spread. How much money do you need? <laughs> you know, this is when I had to reach deep. Right? Because, like, I got to get the number, right? So I'd like, Carl, I need $85,000. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where do, where do you want me to send it? Just like that. Boom, man, I'm telling you, my draw hit the floor. I was like, uh, 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 because I didn't even know what the hell to do with that money at that point. I'm like, <laughs> right? Carl, I'm going to have to get back to you tomorrow. We'll figure it out, right? But we did. And, dude, I raised my first piece of private money. And I'm going to tell you, it changed my life. 
right? That moment right there changed my life. Out of all the things that I've ever done in the game of real estate, if I could narrow it down to one thing, Corey, this one thing right here made the difference and set me ahead of so many other people that started the same time that I did, that one thing is the ability to raise private capital. Because I'm telling you, as sure as I'm sitting here, when, when I did this, so the thing about capital that I learned is that a lot of us have a lot of limiting beliefs about it. And I sure as hell did. Corey, is, am I, and this is self-talk, am I good enough? You know, will people actually give me their money? What if they know about where I live or how I am? You know, will they still give me their money, right? What if they know me? Listen, when Carl gave me that $85,000, it ripped every limiting belief I'd ever had about that. And I like to say, I went into the phone booth as Clark Kent, and I spun around that thing, and I come up saying, Superman, baby, I raise private money! And that's the feeling of it, right? But So here's what I learned from Carl. Number one, Never ask people for money. You never ask them. I've never asked. Last year, I didn't do one billion, but I did 10 million. 10 million is respectful, right? Hell yeah, it is. Right? $10 million. Never asking people for money. Right? You only ask, who do you know? That's what I did with Carl. Right? The system's never changed in what I do. I never ask people for money. I've only shared with them what I'm doing in hopes that they might be able to refer me people and then the right people, and it always the same, they self-select. Like Carl did and said, Corey, I'm your guy. And the wrong people, by you, why you know, the wrong people will run away. And that's okay, because we don't need them, right? And so those two concepts are huge, right? Can I get an amen? Hell yeah, right? All right, so let's, let me give you some more education here, right? So if you take that a step, so once I opened my eyes to private money, then I was like, well, how do I go get a crap ton? Like, how do I, you know, because once you break a limiting belief, like the whole world opens up to you, right? That's what happened for me. It was like my eyes had like, you know, I felt like Paul in the Bible, I could see again, right? I'm like, oh my God. And so all I was thinking about was what are other people doing out there that's successful, right? And so I found that you needed two things, two things. One, if you're a multifamily investor syndicating. Two, if you're a, a single family. So for single family fix and flip people, right, you need a credibility kit, right? What is a credibility kit in single families? It's before and after photos. That's it, right? I had before and after photos and what I sold it for on the MLS. Now, if you don't have that, go find a partner that does, right? Like, that's how you do it. <laughs> like, my first deals, when I had my first credibility kit, none of them were my deals because I wholesaled them to all my investors. But since I was part of it, right, those were my deals, damn it. And so I just used them because I had the first photos and I got the second photos from the MLS, right? There's my after. <laughs> right? You got to be resourceful in this business, am I right? Right? Okay, so credibility kit, one, before and afters. And then number two is you got to have a private money program, right? What is a private money program? It's something that states that you take money from people and here are your terms, right? Because see, when you go to the hard money lender, what does he give you? His terms. Right? And we don't want people to give, uh, we want to give people our terms. Because Tim, you know, generally when we're doing it, we're stacking the deck for who? Right? Us. Right? Investors. Rightfully so. Right? Because I'm telling you, money out there is looking for people like us. Deal makers. That can give a solid return for their money. Because I don't know if you guys checked what happened yesterday. In the stock market, some scary crap. People are scared to, cr I mean, I'm telling you. I had one of my investors text me. I'm so thankful 
If I, I don't want to read it, but like, but basically she said, listen, I'm so thankful that I met you and you took me out of the stock market. It's so nice not having to worry about what just happened yesterday. And do you, know, you want to tell, put a smile on my face? I'm changing people's lives. See, Ray, I used to think that money was in the or money was in real estate, right? I'm telling you, it's not. Believe it or not, this is crazy, right? You want to make real money. The money is in the money. Fact. The money is in the money because I can raise capital and I can command it and say. And this is the difference between hard money and private money, right? Hard money gives you all the rules of how you're going to do it. They're going to dictate all the terms. Private money says. Hey, John, I need $200,000. I need you to send it to this account, okay? And he says, yeah, no problem. Hold on, I'm going to the bank now, right? Like when you say jump, they say how high. That's how it's done, right? That's, you know, Troy said, talked about relationships. That's what it is. It starts there, but that's the kind of re what, what it can do for you, what raising capital can really do for you, okay? All right, so, yeah, let's get to the slide. I get it, right? So now, raising capital, the first part that we want to do. So when we want to start talking about money, we've got to change our conversations, okay? So the first conversation we have with new people or people that we don't know, they're going to say, hey, uh, what do you do? And what's your answer? Yeah. Okay, you're good, perfect, but okay, we're going to change that for a minute. I'm looking for someone to say real estate, right? Because I have it up there. What do you do? You say, oh, I'm in real estate, right? Now, once you say, oh, I'm in real estate, what does everybody's mind go to? You're a what? Agent. You're an agent. You're a realtor, right? Well, are we talking about money at that point? No. Hell no, right? Sometimes they look at you funny and they turn their head and say, are you all right? Are you doing all right? You, you struggling? Are you struggling, realtor? Are you making any money, right? You know what I'm saying? People look at you funny, you go, oh, you're real estate? How's that working out? Right? <laughs> so we can't say that. We can't say that. Right? Now, what you can say is, you know, I buy apartments across the country that provide my investors with a strong return and a nice back end. Right? How's the market treating you? Now, the whole really important part of that thing is what I just did at the end, and I asked a stupid question. Okay, this right here is the money maker. If you want to talk about money, we've got to frame the question to get us on money. So how's the market treating you is a simple question. Now we have dialogue, it, and it doesn't matter what you say, right? How's the market treating you? Oh, it's great. Awesome. What do you love about it? You know, what do you hate about it? You know, what are you invested in, right? Now, if I'm actually really interested in somebody a lot, right, and I, but I stated my first statement, which is I'm a real estate guy, and I make my investors' money grow. Eventually, they're going to ask me what? What are they going to ask me? How do you do that, right? They're going to they're come back, and they're going to ask me a question, right? That's how it works, folks. Like, raising private money 101 is to go meet people, shake their hands, and like, so where do you find these people? Chamber of Commerce, that's the easy one, right? I'm going to tell you my best hunting hole, honey hole, right? Go join a charity, right? Listen, go find a charity that you love, not one that you want to go there for money. Go find a charity that you'd really love, enjoy, and then get involved. Be the person that's on the board, right? Because then you'll get to know everybody that's in that board with you, right? And they're going to start asking, Corey, what do you do? Right? I got an investor named uh, Dick, and, and, and Dick, I met, I'm a Rotarian. I met him at a Rotary meeting one time for like, he sat right next to me, and the next week we're having a, a coffee, and I'm explaining on a napkin how I raised private money, and he gives me 300K, right? And you know what he said? He's like, because you're a Rotarian. I know you're a good guy. I know what you stand for, right? And so find charities that you enjoy and get involved. I'm telling you, capital hangs out there. If you like to golf, now Corey hates to golf. He sucks at it. Right? But if I was a damn good golfer, I'd go buy my membership at the best golf course I could afford and start meeting people and telling my story. Because I had six hours with them on the course. Right? Like that's, that's how you get it done. That's how you meet people with money. Right? And then you start asking them, you know, how's the market treating you? Well, 
You know, it's got to be conversations about money. Now, eventually, eventually, because what are we trying to do if we're out there, uh, you know, we're asking, they're, they're going to start asking us, like, well, how do you get that money? What kind of returns do you make, right? So uh, when they do that, then you, you got to do the Heisman, right? Because a lot of us, when we start, guess what we do? We like to vomit. We throw up on you. Ah, here's what I do. Ah, right? I mean, him, you guys, you know what that feels like? Right? You're like, gosh, damn, man. No, no. I just, no. So that's not how we do it, right? Once they start getting really interested, that's the time where you pull back. Whoa. You know, I'm regulated by the SEC for me and apartments. I am, right? And listen, can we just be intentional? This is one of my favorite segments. When I get a couple questions and they're, they're really interested, I know that they're interested, then I say, hey, listen, can we just be intentional for a minute? Um, let's, let's do coffee next week. Because I, I would love to tell you more about what I do. This is not really the time or the place to, to get real intentional. And can we do that? And guess what people usually say? Yeah. And so we just look, calendar it up, man. Calendar it up right there. Boom. And now we just took someone that we met, that we had some conversations with, right? How do you, you know, how's the market treating you? They tell me what they like. They eventually ask me some questions about myself. They start getting a little bit more interested. I pull it back, and I just set an appointment, which was the goal of what I wanted to do, right? And so when you have, then when you go to that meeting, you're going to use either Troy's packet, or we have a, you know, I create a, it's, I, I, that's why you have your credibility kit. And all that is, is just like, remember like when you had a, like, anybody got a financial advisor, right? So like when they're selling you that mutual fund, Right, that mutual fund is like a page, real nice, like, all right, so this fund did this, this fund did that, right, and here's the history of it. That's your credibility kit. It tells the story about what you do, right? And when you tell people that story, they're like, well, yeah, I'm interested in stuff like that, so let me know when you have a deal, right? And that's really, at the end of the day, that is how you raise, I mean, a crap ton of private money, right? So, I know this, like, this room's full of superheroes, am I right? Yeah, there we go. Damn right. But you gotta, you gotta discover it, right? You gotta discover, and you gotta wake it up. You gotta wake it up. A lot of us are here, but we're not freaking here, right? You gotta get in the game. Like, just playing real estate's not going to do it for you. You've got to get really focused, right? For me, my focus was my why. I, I wanted a business that worked for me. Right? I wanted, you know, I could say, like, this picture here is one of my favorites with me and my son. Son, go out there in life. Take huge risks. Do everything that you can. Live life to the fullest. Don't ever look back. But know if you ever get into some trouble, right? Backups. Never far behind. I'm here for you, son. I'm going to catch you when you fall. I'll mend your wounds. I'll get you back up. And I'm going to kick you back out there in the front of the light to go out and do what you got to do. That's how you become successful, guys, right? And for me, my, my drive was my why. But I do, lead, I do believe a lot of times you need a roadmap, right? I'm trying to lay out a little bit of a roadmap so you can see that I understand how to do it. I've done it, right? And I started from nothing, right? So I, and I, and I, if I started from nothing and I did it, if you follow my steps, it would probably work for you, right? I, I'm telling you, it does, okay? So let me kind of go this little story here. So... Three things my dad taught me, right? Number one, my dad, when I was young, now I don't know about you guys, for, you, for how you guys feel, but for me, when I was a little kid, my dad was a Greek god. He was a, he was a roofer, okay? Does anybody know anything about the roofing business? Freaking hard, right? Hard work, man. The hardest work I've ever done as a little, little boy, right? And as five years old, man, all I wanted to do was be with my dad. My dad had wild, you know, six foot, now he was, he's taller than me, six foot two, wild brown hair, real dark, big black beard, and tan from the waist up, right? <laughs> and he was just a mountain of a man, and I was like, that's my dad. And I'd beg him, I'd beg him to let him me go to work with him, right? Five years old. Finally, he's like, yeah, son, let's go to work, right? So I get on the roof with my dad. My dad gets on his knees and says, son, I'm going to tell you about today. Today's going to be a lot of hard work, right? But here's what we're going to do. When we're faced with hard work, we make it a game. We make it a game. And today's game that we're going to play is who 
can get to the top of the ridge first, right? That's all I need. I'm like, yeah. All right, because the, there's... We were on one side, my dad, or another roofer was on the other side. And that's all I needed. Like that, I'm like, let's go get it, Dad. Yeah. And my job as a young boy was to break those shingle bundles, right? Unstick them and lay it out for my dad. So my dad, pop, 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 pop. I mean, we were just hauling, dude. And guess what? Guess we got the rich first. We did. And we didn't win by just a little bit. We won by a lot. Now, but what my dad did next taught me everything. Right? Because we could have sat there and basked in the glory. Right? But Dad said, son, let's go over here. And we jumped on the other side. He goes, let's help this roofer out. We jumped on the other side, and we helped that roofer bring all his shingles to the top of the ridge. Right? Talk about having humility. Right? Helping out your fellow man. Right? So make work a game. Lesson number two my dad taught me. Corey, now, my dad, you know, he got taken out at home plate when he was playing with the Cleveland Indians. He broke his back. Um, game over, right? And then he became a roofer, <laughs> right? But dad never lost love for the game, and he was my baseball coach. And he would say, son, when you get up to bat, swing for the fences. Swing for the fences. Don't ever be ashamed to give it all you got. Put it all on the line and swing for the fences, son. But when you do it, no that more often than not, you're going to strike out. And when that time happens, it's what you do that will define you, son. Gather yourself up, right? Grab your bat, start hustling back to the dugout. But as you're going to the dugout, out of the corner of your eye, look at that picture and look him right in the eye and say, you may have got me today, I'm gonna get you tomorrow, right? I'll never stop. You will never be able to defeat me. I will keep coming back, right? Isn't that what life is? Is the ability to keep coming back? As an entrepreneur, you have to be willing to take the licks, get the strikeouts, because no one will remember your losses, people. They don't care. They only look at your success. I promise you that, right? But you have to be willing to go through the pain. Third thing that my dad taught me is, Corey, always hustle. Always hustle, right? He's like, son, if, if a coach would say, hey, go run around that tree, you better be first. The only way you're not first is if someone physically beats you because most of the time it's freaking mental. Am I right? It's a freaking mental game, and most people are never willing to do it. In life, you got to hustle to get the work, to get the the worm, man. You got to be the first. You got to grind a little harder, especially when you're starting from scratch and you want to get somewhere that you're not. Right? You got to put in that drive. And most of us are not prepared to do it. Right? So you've got to hustle. Right? Make work a game. Swing for the fences. Right? And hustle in everything that you do. Right? Now, just like my dad taught me, I would like to jump on the other side of the roof with you guys, right? And I've got a wonderful gift that I would like to share with you is if you guys will text uh, RPM to that number, I'm gonna give you my uh, free Raising Private Money course, okay? It's like 600 bucks, it's free to you guys, okay? And I just lay out step by step everything I taught, just this, but a hell of a lot more. And that's my gift for actually listening to me rant and rave, okay? Now, as I close, I'm not done yet, thank you, thank you. All right. So let me give you some marching orders, right, in this life, game of life, right, and, and wanting to get somewhere, right? Success. You guys understand, like, success, it takes determination, okay? Things changed in my life in real estate. Not, I started real estate in 2005, but I didn't actually become a real estate investor until 2009, and in 2009, I was still a financial advisor. So I had my foot in the door, right, but I wasn't committed. I was playing real estate. 2009, I got fired from Edward Jones because the market crashed and my heart left the job. And so I was stuck with a choice of where was I, what was, what was I going to do next? And I remember it vividly. I sat alone in a four-room walls with myself, pondering what am I going to be, what am I going to do? And I'm telling you, in those four walls, I made the most deep, wrenching, gut-wrenching, I'm telling you, everything that I am 
commitment. I mean commitment to myself that I was going to be a successful real estate investor. I mean, I remember it clearly, that decision that today is the day I will stand and say I will never fail and I will never quit. I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing up here in front of you, it takes that level of commitment, that drive to be successful. If you are not willing to do it, if you're not willing to burn all the bridges as you go across them, because real estate entrepreneurship is a hard business. It's hard. You're going to fail. Man, I got, I failed so many times. I don't even want to tell you it. Like, that's the reason I'm successful. And I was always willing to fail. Not just once, but 5,000 times. I never cared. I never cared. Right? My challenge to you is to, before you leave this room, is to tell yourself that today is the day, right? Today is the day that I will commit to myself, like no one else is watching. Make it to yourself and say, today is the day that I'm going to change and I'm going to live a life of freedom and destiny, right? You guys got some tools to be it. And just so everybody know, my favorite quote right here is this is what it's all about for me, right? Passive income, passive income. Fix and flip's great, wholesaling is great. Those, your trader, your trader, when you do this, with a D, if you do it long enough, you may feel like with an AI, trader, right? Because we all read Rich Dad Poor Dad, Rich Dad Poor Dad, he all talked about cash flow. Robert never talked about quick flip. Cash flow, cash flow will set you free, guys. I promise you that, right? Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, hold on one second. You want to take any questions? Got a yeah, couple minutes yeah. for questions? Yeah. Who's got questions? Yeah. The texting program is called uh, Fix Your Funnel. With, uh, it's a, a plug-in to Infusionsoft. Yeah. Pretty cool though, right? No, my dad taught me not to be a roofer, right? <laughs> my dad's like, son, this is going to kick your butt, dude. And I knew right then, I was like, no, I'm out, man. Um, dad said, go, you know, try to go to school. And honestly, I, I, you know, I went on a weird route, man. I didn't get the download from the mothership until I was 32. You know, that's kind of older. I'm an older cat. But, um, you know, I honestly didn't have a degree. I was trying to figure out what it, but I, when I went to Bruce's place, I mean, it was crystal clear that real estate was the way. I just didn't know how to do it. And so I started reading books. And then I found mentors. And mentors are really what always has changed the game for me. I found a rent, uh, mentor in, in multifamily. That's how I learned the business. And I, I, I skyrocketed. What did you do with the baby boy? What did I do? What? What did you do with the baby boy? The 86, I bought a fix and flip. Right? I, when I got, first got that first piece of private money. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, can I, yeah. Yeah, go for so, it. So, um, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an expanded version too, right? So, the short version, when you're in like a B and I group or like quick deal, I buy, uh, I buy cash flowing apartments across the United States that provide my investors with a nice return and a strong back end. How's the market treating you? Now, if I've got a little bit of time, I'm actually going to tell a story. I call this my longer version. I call this my uh, Susie income story. Hey, Corey, what do you do? Man, I, and when I tell this story, I think of one of my clients, her name's LaVon, right? So I go, Corey, what do you do? Man, I help people like uh, Susie. You know, Susie was married for like 32 years and um, a wonderful husband. She saved some money, her and her husband. Her husband was still working. And then all of a sudden, her husband died. And dude, Susie was in distress because A, her husband died. But number B, like she needed the income and she was just worried sick. Luckily, Susie knew me, and I was able to show her how I could put her money in a passive apartments, and she could almost double her return. And that allowed her to not have to worry about money so she could grieve her husband. Right? I'm a real estate investor. I buy you know, properties across the country that provide investment. You know, that whole spill, right? I help people like Susie. How's the market treating you? Right? Cool? 
We've got time for one more question. Yes. Yeah, great question. All right. So when I made $4.8 million profit from my first deal. Now, how many deals did it take to be successful in real estate? In commercial or apartments? Just one. Just one. I took $4.8 million. I did a 1031 exchange so I didn't have to pay any taxes. I bought a $12.7 million property that pays me half a million dollars in passive income for the rest of my life. And guess what? Our tenants expect, expect rent to go up, and we never disappoint them. <laughs> Big round of applause, folks. Uh, thank you, sir. All right, we're going to do something a little different here. We're going to take a vote. Who wants to take? All right, here's your two choices. 15-minute break, come back at 8, or we go right into the panel. So raise your hand for 15-minute break. I don't know, Ryan, what do you think? And raise your hand for panel. I don't know, I think we're going to roll right into the panel, dude. It looks like panel it is. Uh, so what we'll do is we're going to take like 45 seconds to two minutes. Uh, so if you are one of the people that wanted a break, go get a break. Uh, if we can get the AC turned back on, I don't know if people are complaining that it's cold, but it's, now it's hot. Um, and we're going to lift up the screen. And if I can get Eddie Speed, if I can get Daniel Moore uh, to join us up on stage. I want to do like parting of the Red Sea. There we go. La, la, la. The magic. And then what we're going to do. Yeah. All right, cool. And then we're back on stage here shortly. If you need to take a, if you need a Can I get that other mic up here, please, sir? Y'all enjoying it so far? Thank you, three of you. Can I, can I get another poll? Are y'all enjoying it so far? All right, that was like seven. Yeah. Yeah, just turn them on now. All right, y'all ready for the next round? Do y'all want the, do we need mood lighting? Do y'all want to mood light it down here a little bit? Justin, where you at? Can you turn the house, the house lights down? Ooh. Ooh. I like, Ooh. I like it. That's, this is what I signed up for. <laughs> How you doing, Eddie? How are you? <laughs> doing good. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you.
While we're getting set up, do y'all like free stuff? Yeah. Oh, that got some people. Yeah, free shit, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who? Here's your trivia question. Who does not have a copy of Richest Man in Babylon? Oh, I love this. And who can race up here? <laughs> boom. Boom. Okay. Boom. 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 And then, I don't have that, but you want that? Boom. And we'll give you that. Boom. Propelio, make dreams happen with free stuff, right? All right. Where'd Daniel go? You leave us again? We got quiet. I got to like the mood lighting. All right. I'll make an announcement next door real quick. Hey, everybody. We are starting the panel at Raising Capital. So if you have questions about getting money, if you want to learn this stuff, uh, come to the room. We'll have a panel. And we'll have... It's for next door. Fine. Thank you. <laughs> uh, come on into the theater. We're over there. Uh, and we'll do Q&A at the end. So go on to the panel. Mic drop. Shit, let's not. <laughs> this is rental stuff. Where did, where did Dan go? Anyway, so I think the best way to start would be to like, we've heard from Corey, we've heard from Troy, give Eddie about two minutes. Um, oh, ab absolutely, yeah. I didn't mean to take over your job. No, that's fine. <laughs> hey, the check cash is the same. Anyway, <laughs> give it up for Mr. Jason Bible moderating so far, emceeing so far. Oh, Excellent. that's it? Come on. I need to find some AC. It makes it sound like, so I've got Facebook Live up, and there's so much light, they can't see you. It sounds like there's six people here. So let's get a little louder. All right, that's much better. Oh, we got everybody here. All right. All right, can I get another round of applause for Troy and Corey? Fantastic presentations, gentlemen. All right, let's get started with Mr. Mr. Eddie Speed. I'm going to introduce you, and then if you want to add some uh, additional stuff here, you are welcome to. Eddie Speed is founder of Note School, president of Colonial Funding Group, LLC. He started the note industry in 1980 and closed over 40,000 transactions in over 40 years. Eddie Speed, everybody. <laughs> Any additional comments? Is that good? Is that enough? That's, prob that's probably enough. Huh? All right. Uh, Daniel Moore is co-founder of Propelio, principal in hundreds of transactions uh, ranging from wholesale rehab, short sub twos, wraps, Lonnie deals. Who knows what Lonnie deals are? Deals on wheels. All right. Uh, new construction, commercial office, and industrial. Daniel Moore, everybody, round of applause. All right. First question, whoever's got the mic will let you go first. Where's the money tree? In other words, where do investors exist? Who wants to go first? Um, the money tree is it's kind of like the force. <laughs> it's so all it's around you, right? But that's the truth is money, there's, there's never a lack of supply of money. Money's everywhere. Um, but specifically, if you ask me, I would say um, go to where money hangs out, charities, clubs, um, galas, right, um, golf events, golf places, um, you know, those, uh, church, church, I mean, gosh darn, there's just so many places where you can find money, that's, that's what I say. Well, I would say the money tree is, is high net worth people that are looking for alternatives other than traditional stocks and bonds, right? It's not everybody in the population. Probably it's really 10% of the population. And, and where you spend your social time may not be where you spend your time to go chase capital investors. So it's, I find myself in a lot of the training space, people are hanging out in a crowd that the investors want too much money or they don't have any money. That's not the money tree. So you have to be very distinctive in my mind in figuring out where to go in a network where people have that capital available. Testing. Um, for me, it's Wall Street. It's institutions, um, endowment funds, 
things like that because they're always looking to deploy capital, but it's a different approach than the private investor sector as a whole. So my feedback is I, I'm, I, do, I do a little different than what people here on the panel do. On my side, I am a massive introvert, so going out and just approaching some of these professionals is extremely difficult for me, but the way I have secured most, if not all of my capital, is through Ray events. I'll show up to a Ray event, and I'll just be sitting on the side wall somewhere, not really doing much, but somebody will approach me and they'll ask me a question because they know me through a network, and they'll say, hey, I'm trying to do this, how do I do that? And then through that conversation, a crowd will form. And as that crowd will form, people start hearing that I understand the business. They understand and they can see value in my ability. And they'll start talking about deals that I'm doing. And every time, without a doubt, one of those people will pull me to the side afterwards and say something along the lines of, I'm looking to place some capital. Is there opportunity? They start making introductions for me. So those are the ways that I have secured private capital on my side. All right, Daniel, we'll start with you. This will be kind of rapid fire down the, down the line here. How long does it take from initial conversation to the first deal funded when meeting with a lender? On my side, that has been relatively quickly. I haven't really had to cultivate many of those relationships because many of them have came through referrals or just through my knowledge of the industry. Somebody will generally walk up to me and say, hey, can I place capital with you versus me going up to somebody saying, can you give me money? I have not raised billions of dollars, but I've had a steady access to close to nine figures for the last four to five years. And that has all came through referrals as well as just people coming up to me saying, I want to place money with you. So the, the cultivation has been rather simple. That's a great answer. Um, my experience is when you're going at, as far as the institutions and things like that, really you're going to start to build the relationship first before you start asking for money. So it could take two or three weeks if you're pinned, if you're dialed into, you know, creating that relationship with somebody that's of like-mindedness. Where most people stumble is they're trying to raise capital with an institutional investor that's not like-minded. They're they're more interested in tech and healthcare and stuff, and you're trying to talk real estate. So that's always, so you want to make sure that that's pinpointed right up front. And that'll, how do they speed up the process? Keep in mind that institutions are, you know, they do not like the idea that money's sitting on the sidelines. So they're looking for deals. And what's funny is you're looking for capital. So already there's a synergy there. It's really just a matter of are you putting your stuff in front of them in a timely fashion? And I've found that they'll usually, you know, when you go and ask for capital, you know, 90 days or less, sometimes it's gone over that. <laughs> but I'm looking for 6 or 7% money, and that money's got to germinate, and the cycle of that money is probably four to six months. I'm on a more on the Eddie Speed route. Uh, most of our stuff's relationships. Um, I do source the cheap uh, capital as well. I believe in cheap capital. Um, and not giving away the bank. I, I'm in real estate for Corey Peterson, and I'm, I'm supposed to pay my capital a good, solid rate of return, not a stupid return, right? And so to get the right people involved in that, they've got to see a process. And, and honestly, what happens is a lot of them will dip their foot in the pool, right? They'll give you, you know, your minimum, and they always got more. That's the biggest thing, right? The capital always has a lot. They want to see you perform. They want to see you give them their money back with some interest. When you do that, they will start to deploy and they'll have friends. So we'll start with you, Corey, on this one. How can you work with a private money lender that has less than 50 grand? Don't do it. <laughs> I, I won't. Yeah. I haven't had a good experience with taking super small amounts of money from people. <clears throat> I, I found out usually when you do that, you're, you're, you're dealing with money that's really close to them, that, that don't have a lot of money, 
And if the deal gets delayed or if anything goes wrong, honestly, they just take the, they just wear you out. And so I just, you know, sometimes I've done deals with a small amount of money, but I knew they had a more significant amount. But my life experience has been do not take money from poor people because it just, they, they, it's, it's too precious to them. And it should be. Yeah, I would piggyback off of uh, Eddie's answer and Corey's answer there. You know, small money is, is hard money. It comes with a lot of emotions and a lot of baggage and a lot of expectations. And to dial in their expectations into your business model is oftentimes hard to do. And they can become, how do you say, what do they say in Texas? Like a burr in their saddle? Oh, yeah, be a burr in their saddle. Arizona, we just say they're a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> a little more PC here in Texas. Um, but in it, in it, in like Eddie said, it, it really is precious to them. You know, if somebody gives you $50,000, you could probably estimate that their overall net worth is maybe 200000 You know, maybe they're pushing the envelope on it. So they've, you've just taken a quarter of their net worth. And so they're watching it like a hawk. And anytime there's a report that comes out on some news station about the, the real estate market doing this or the real estate market doing that, you're on speed dial with them. They're calling you. And they want to know if th how this is going to impact their investment. And you've got to walk them through the whole pro process all over again. So keep in mind, I'm not saying I would never do it. Like in earlier days, if you've never done a deal and you're willing to, how do you say, cultivate that relationship and you're willing to, to take those phone calls, then that may be a place where you start. But as you, you know, like I said, that's a place where you start. That's a place where you start. And then you go from there. Because you can't scale a business if you're having to micromanage all of your investors as a whole. It's just, you, know, you have to have that maturity level there with them. And you want to be looking for investors that have, you know, millions and millions of dollars. And with that, if they give you half a million or a million, that's like you know 10% of their portfolio. Not to mention they're much more mature because that's what it took to earn that money. You see the difference? So keep that in mind. I would have to resonate yet again what the panel has said in regards to working with the wrong capital partner can destroy your life. It's like a marriage. At the moment in time, you own their, you have access to their money, and you are using their money. Uh, they will become a, a a speed dial for you. But it goes back to where Troy is saying, cultivate that relationship. So there's communities around here like Quest IRA, and the Quest IRA has a lot of members with limited amounts of capital that are looking to be placing it, and they've already been trained in the real estate side of it, so they are familiar with generating notes and how these partnerships work. So a lot of the plays where I've worked with limited people with small amounts of capital is working with them on creative funds where we do gap funds. but we're doing it on a personal property asset with a UCC security agreement, and I only need eight to $10,000 to knock one of those deals down. So I can start doing Lonnie deals, give them 16%, I collect 84%, and I'm cash flowing on notes like none other. So there's creative ways of doing gap funding, seconds, and stuff like that with limited capital. Hey, Daniel, can you just share what a Lonnie deal is real quick? We're talking about mobile homes, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So on a Lonnie deal is where I find a, a mobile home classified as personal property in a mobile home park. I'll purchase that asset for under 10 grand all in. And under 10 grand all in, I will then turn around and sell it on a note on three to four thousand dollars down. So my exposed capital is somewhere between six to seven thousand dollars, but I'm collecting four hundred dollars a month in cash flow, true cash flow off of that asset. And that gives me a phenomenal return. I can then take that return and extend a phenomenal return to a small dollar amount IRA and collect myself a significant return off of somebody else's capital with zero money in that deal. Most of my investing has been zero money deals on my side. All right, this is one of my favorite questions, and I'm going to add an addendum to it here. It says, what do you do if the deal goes south? And I would love to hear from you guys, and I'll just totally leave it up to whoever wants to answer this one. What was the last deal you did that you lost money?
mean, the first one I thought I did was uh, invincible. The second one I did, I bought a smaller unit complex. Um, you know, paid a little bit more, too much money, money for it. Hired a third party management <coughs> company that was out of the, you know, out of the region. And, um, you know, and so hold the property for two years, didn't give my investors a return. Finally hired the right people, fixed the situation, but it was two years later. Those were hard calls to make every month, right? Because when you're not performing, and doing, you gotta have monthly calls. Like I'm having monthly calls with my investors. Hardest two years of my life, right? Um, when we finally exited the accident, it still cost me $150,000 of my money. But uh, Eddie just said it, listen, understand if money is the real game, if raising capital is the way to accelerate everything you're doing, it is the one thing that you hold near and dear to your heart, to your core, and you will do everything in your power to make it right with your money because you only get one chance, right? On that deal, half of the investors that I had were new investors. They will never invest with Corey Peterson ever again. Now the other half had done other deals and they gladly reinvested, right? But you get one chance with investors and you have to do right by them. All right, excellent. Thanks for sharing, guys. A lot of people don't share that. Big round of applause. For guys on the panel. All right, so let's say, here's the scenario. You guys, your entire companies are wiped out. You gotta start from square one. You gotta start from zero. Where would be the first two places you would go to raise private capital? And we'll start with you, Corey. I mean, I wouldn't go anywhere. I'd just make a couple phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. When you start raising money, I mean, listen, I mean, we don't, I don't go meet money so much anymore. I mean, I don't mind, but I would just pull out my phone, just like Troy said, it's your Rolodex, man, um, starting from, from scratch. But if, I, if you're saying I got to go to a physical place, I just go to like my Rotary Club and say, guys, I, I need help. Don't ever be afraid to ask for help, right? That, I usually, I use that a lot. Hey, even when I'm looking for referrals with my investors, hey guys, um, you know, glad that you've been in our deals for a while. Like, I need some help. I've got a new project coming up. Who do you know that I should know, right? Who do you know at work? Who do you know that you play golf with that I should know? It's an easy way to get a referral. Well, first I would go to a dental convention, <laughs> and then I would go to a surgeon's convention. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, that's all great advice. Um, it's not a mystery to any of us who are the highest net worth professions in America. And Eddie tapped into that, and, and Corey's tapped into that as well. And that's what I would go to. I would go to those folks, especially if you're starting over, because you kind of have to rebuild your track record. You know, if you crash and burn, which you know it happens in the business, it's not a lot of fun. It doesn't. That's not something that goes up on a billboard but it certainly comes out in intimate settings like this. I would definitely go and, and reach out to just high net worth people, you know, athletes, doctors, lawyers, dentists, you know, you, you get the drift. And guess what? They're in every single city in this country. So you don't have to necessarily go to like their national convention, find out what they're doing on a local level and show up there. Um. I'd say starting over is probably one of the easiest things there are because you've already figured the system out. I mean, the hardest thing I think is in the beginning figuring that system out. But like the panel has resonated is it's like I just pull up, pull up my phone. Like my network is deep enough now that that starting over would not be a tragedy at all. It would just be like we've already figured that wheel out. But for anybody that's starting out new, I think the same thing we are talking about earlier with the money tree, it's just putting yourself in a position where high net worth individuals can figure out what you're doing. I, being a massive introvert, would be very difficult going to a doctor's convention. I would have to pay to be on the stage or something because a one-on-one -on -one relationship is hard for me to cultivate. But if I come into a scenario like this where I'm at Araya, I am very comfortable talking about real estate. And if I just hit the fan again, I could be dropped down at any place in the United States. I'd walk into Araya and I'd just start talking about my experience. And I would not need to ask for money. Money would come to me. That's how I have secured all of my capital was through referrals or through people just hearing me talk about business and they understand that I have the knowledge that they feel secure with. So I'm hearing a theme here, guys, and that is you've already built the network. 
whether you've got to start over today with zero dollars or not, you've already built the network. So the root word of network is what? Work. So when you guys are out here networking with all these folks, find out what everybody does. See if you've got somebody that's got some private capital that's willing to lend. All right, I'm going to do one more question for you guys, and I think we ought to open it up to the audience. And this doesn't have to be capital specific, but just in general. What is the one thing that you wish you knew sooner as it relates to real estate and note investing? What's that one thing that, say you're four or five years into the business, and you go, damn, I wish I knew that five years ago. It's that one thing you wish you knew when you first started out. And I'll just let you guys, whoever wants to start this one off, you can pick up the mic, start chatting. Dream bigger. Dream bigger would be the thing I would have told myself a long time ago. I would have saved myself many, many weeks away from my family and everything else had I just dreamed bigger to start out. We hear about wholesaling as a way to get into this business. We hear about X, Y, and Z learn at a very early onset to add zeros to everything you're doing. Had I taken that advice earlier, my net worth would have climbed much faster. I got stuck into the wholesaling, the rehabbing and stuff. But at the point in time I started doing million dollar deals, multi-million dollar deals, that is when I truly started seeing my life change. And there was no difference doing multi-million dollar deals 10 years in versus doing them the first year in. And had I had the confidence and or the right guidance early on to just say, you know what, there's no difference between a $10 million deal and a $500,000 deal. And I know that's hard, but the only difference between those two is the knowledge that you have acquired. If you focus on acquiring the knowledge to do a $10 million deal within your first year, within the first year, what are you looking at? $10 million deals because you have gained the knowledge and confidence to do so. And I wish I would not have told myself early on that this is where I need to be, wholesaling, $100,000 house, quarter million dollar house. My, my growth was stagnant because of that. And had I just started popping off $10 million deals, I would have accelerated much faster. Um, for me, I wouldn't, have waited, I wouldn't have wasted as much time trying to figure things out. I would have just gone all in right up front. You know, and being that, you know, somewhat, there's a portion of me that's very analytical and I like to kind of dissect things and look at things. And that's kind of, na it's kind of the nature of the note business. But at the same time, you can get kind of caught up in the, the paralysis of analysis or analysis of a paralysis, whatever that is. At the end of the day, I would have gone in a lot faster, a lot quicker. I would have taken over bigger markets at a, at a much rap at a, at, a, at a faster pace. I wouldn't have wasted the time that I have wondering if I was on the right track and figuring things out um, to make sure that all my ducks were in a row. You know what about getting your ducks in a row? They don't stay in a row. They don't. That, that cartoon on Saturday mornings, that's not how they work, you know? Mama duck is chasing her baby ducklings all the time. And that's going to be, that's entrepreneurship 101. And you just have to embrace that and, and scale quickly. You know, my grandfather always said, you know, they, they can, there's a lot of things that people can take away from you. But the one thing they'll never take away from you is your knowledge. They can actually take your life before they take your knowledge. So buy into what you have. Believe in yourself. Go for it. Write the, write the $100,000 check. Write the million-dollar check. Write the half-a-million-dollar check. Whatever that is for that next level. If you're comfortable hanging out doing $100,000 houses, guess what? Tomorrow go do a $200,000 house. Don't hang out at a $100,000 level for the next six months trying to perfect it because you won't perfect it. But if you go up to the next level, 200, 250, half a million dollars, then into commercial like Corey's doing and then into the notes like Eddie and I are doing, start building that generational wealth. Why do you want to build generational wealth? Simply. Because if you take it all in cash, you're going to spend it. That's the American way. But if you leave it out there working for you, like Corey's doing, Eddie's doing, I'm doing, Daniel, Daryl's doing. I keep messing that up, man. I did that yesterday on the recording. Cash flow is sexy, right, bro? Cash flow is sexy. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what creates the, the lifestyle, the vision. I mean, I see Eddie on his troops. I see you on yours. I see Corey on his. Everybody's like living this dream. We didn't live the dream doing $30,000 houses. We didn't live the dream doing wholesale. Yeah, we may have started there. I started wholesaling notes. You wanna know why I started wholesaling notes? Because I didn't have two red cents to rub together. So I just had to build up that capital 
and I should have gone into buying notes a lot faster, but I spent three years just wholesaling notes as a whole, uh, in general. In looking back on it, I would have bought a lot more a lot faster and built up a lot quicker. And that way, things would be different at the end of the day. That's my advice. That's some good advice, <laughs> both of those guys, and he'll have some too. Um, two things, I guess I would say. First of all, I've traded 40,000 notes. I don't think that's impressive. I would have rather owned 8,000 notes to the end than have traded 40,000 notes to somebody else. Okay? So I own a lot of notes now but it took me a longer in my life to learn it. So, yes, I started in a 10 by 40 mobile home and I didn't have any money and I didn't know how to do anything else but use somebody else's money, but I didn't really know how to use somebody else's money. Second thing is this. In 1987, a man called me to sell me two or three notes. That man's name was Ken D'Angelo. Anybody know who Ken D'Angelo is? So, so I bought those notes from Ken D'Angelo and we formed a friendship. In 1992, he called me and he says, Eddie, I want my franchise to have a note system and I want you to design it. So I signed the, designed the note system for Homevestors in 1992. I learned instead of buying one note at a time to go buy 50 notes at a time, right? So I started teaching real estate investors how to create seller financing correctly and safely and then they could sell those loans. So I learned some things in scale. Now in 1992, I'd been in the business 12 years, right? So it took me a little longer to figure some of this stuff out than it should have. And I look back and think it was probably, as Daniel said, I wasn't thinking big enough. And, and I was just putting one foot in front of the other. And uh, I agree with what these guys are saying. Think big, learn well. Don't, it, there's, no, there's no room for inadequacy, learn well. Don't settle for mediocrity, right? That's why I'm in the education business, why several of us are in the education business. Don't settle for mediocrity, but once you know how to do it, go do it and don't, don't let somebody convince you you can't do it because I think it's God's humor that this cowboy that grew up in the cattle auction barn never had a job but did not wear a pair of spurs till I was 20 years old. Ended up in the paper business because I have dyslexia. And that's a fact. I'm just sitting here, you know, I've had, like, been going last year to think about your answer really good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, what would I tell myself? I, honestly, I don't think, dude, listen, I believe the journey is the reward, man. Like, I look at my life and all the things that I've had to go through, and it's made me who I am today. And so, I don't know necessarily what, know that I would want to change any of it, right? I'm here now, but I wouldn't go back and say, do some, listen, it's a journey. We're all on it, right? But the only advice would be to challenge yourself to dream a, and play a bigger game. We are all playing a pretty big game up here, right? And, but we had a vision to dream that game, right? And the challenge to you guys is you want to be up here. You should be up here, right? And you do that by, by dreaming, learning, educating and doing right that's what it takes all right let's take some questions from the audience and i gotta be honest with you i can't see anybody so you're probably gonna have to come up there, there's a microphone right here Perfect. i do have a question for the panel if you had 12 hours what how much could you raise in 12 hours each of you uh, i'll say maybe a couple million two okay eddie that's probably about right. Two or three million. Okay, now we're to four, five. Troy? What is that? Like? What, is that? <laughs> what, is, what is that? What does that mean? I mean, and I'm not saying it to boast, but I would just call one of my friends on Wall Street. So a lot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Daniel? It's my network that could raise the capital, and it's my ability to just hop on my phone and just fire off some text messages. I have a good track record with some really powerful people, and it's just literally sending out a message real fast. And it's like, 
how much can I get and how fast? So the, the last time I tried to raise capital, we were looking at like a $68 million land acquisition and I needed 12 million fast. And I had committed 12 million within 24 hours. So that was, that was not even a stretch of what could be done. Yeah. I've worked with hedge funds that have strong nine figure accounts that are working on equity splits. So getting access to capital with the right deal is not difficult at all, especially with as deal poor as the world is right now. Capital is sitting on the sidelines waiting for the right asset to be placed on. So there's no scarcity on, on, on capital right now at all. Hold on, I want to put a caveat to that. Okay, okay. So the question should be, how fast can you raise a crap ton of money at the lowest cost of price? That's right, the, yeah. The, 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 main, the point... <laughs> price is always like important, right? To the, to the deal and get, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. the juice so the, the point I'm trying to make is to the audience <laughs> here and the audience on YouTube is you have access to easily 30, 50 million dollars within 12 minutes or 12 minutes, 12 hours. Like the, the floor is y'all's to ask as many questions. If you're on YouTube, ask questions, I'll ask them. So there's a mic. This is your time to get free mentorship. So that's the point. Maybe for those people out there on YouTube, y'all can drop some questions as well, because I know that last time I checked, there were a bunch of y'all out there on social media watching this panel. So drop your questions there. We'll have people watching. So get your questions in now. How's it going, guys? Everybody. So with social impact, are y'all interested in that? Are you focused on that? There are a lot of areas of Dallas, especially South Dallas and West Dallas. The homes are being handed down generationally. Um, they're not necessarily up for sale in the traditional sense. Nobody wants to leave. They want to stay in their communities. Um, there are 38 food deserts in Dallas, meaning that there is not uh, a grocery store or a good source of produce or some other you know, healthful food within um, three miles of their neighborhood. Um, so when it comes to social impact on like green building, um, and then there's a pl there are empty lots just everywhere, right? So. I feel like there's a lot of opportunity to make a real difference and for the investor to make their money as well for it to make sense. Um, have you all run into those situations on an investment side? Uh, is there something that you would offer an advice for someone looking to acquire that kind of capital? Um, so, man, like, this is gonna sound, I don't wanna sound rude on this, cause like, so, I'm a, so with money, I'm a capitalist, right? Like, when I'm raising money, I'm an absolute capitalist, okay? I'm not, uh, all, all my money cares is that I can make money, right? Now, we try to do apartments and we build community that way, right? So that's fixing something up. But I wouldn't say I would necessarily, that, that's a hard deal to try to figure out. I just don't know anything about Dallas. I don't own anything here, but, um, but that's not, I don't make my decision saying, hey, I want to do this great thing. I say, how can I make my investors some money and get it back to them as safe as I can with what I know. And if I could do that, I would. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I, it's not my space. I mean, it's just not something I know or understand. I've been doing the same thing for a long time. And uh, it sounds great if somebody really knew what they were doing. It's just not my space. I would agree, it's, it's not my niche as a whole. I mean, I've had ideas about creating things like veterans villages and stuff like that, where you go in there and you, you know, grab some land and you put some tiny houses and stuff on it. But you know, that's, a, that's a model, you know, it's a philanthropy model. And there's money out there. There's a lot of endowments and stuff like that that look for those types of things. But to run that up the flagpole, like, like institutionally speaking, they're capitalists. They want to know what that return is going to look like, and that's more of a kind of a park it and play and feel good model. Um, and I'm not saying they don't do that because they all have that side of their business. But you'd have to appeal to a different board and a different organization. But you know, I think every city. I know I'm, I'm from Phoenix and Chandler area. Corey and I both are. There are places there that need that kind of you know attention. Uh, personally. I just, there's just not enough hours in a day to, to take on another flag. But if, if that's your passion, the best advice I can give you, if that's like your passion, then I would say like wrap it up in a bow and, and go raise the money on it. Because, and I would go after things like philanthropists and endowments and I would seek out even like, like, like we raised $100,000 in, in Chandler for this thing called Live Love House. And we raised it through, um, oh, I want to say Infusionsoft, that's not it. 
um, Isogenics. Okay, Isogenics headquarters are right there just down the road. Well, they, they created a whole nother trust to go out and do philanthropy work. And so they put a couple, couple million in there to start with and we picked up $100,000 for this Live Love House, which is a community center for kids for, you know, they te we teach them karate and we do after school studies and stuff like that. So it's out there. It is like big time out there, but you'd probably best, um, you'd have the best success raising money by going to corporations here in Dallas, like AT&T. Yeah, I mean, like you build your model, you pick your brand, and then you start going out to even the Dallas Cowboy organization. I guarantee you they've got, you know, philanthropy side to their business, you know? So that's where I would go, go with it. Are you referring to the Fair Park Market? Uh, just south of that and then West Dallas. It just goes and goes for miles. Yeah. Okay, so like Fair Park has been a speculative market for a long time because of its location to Dallas, gentrification, everything else looking like that. But when we're looking at South Dallas, there is opportunity there on many different ways. I would say that if that is your passion, great, but it comes with risks. Uh, the reason the returns in those markets are great is because it comes with a management aspect to it. So when you start looking at Fair Park, Fair Park has increased close to 200% in the last 10 years. So we we're picking up we we're picking up Fair Park at 10 to 15 grand 10 years ago. Right now we're looking at 50 grand to 60, 70 grand. Like I'm seeing deals moving Fair Park at prices I never would have imagined. But that was a long-term play. There was a lot of holding in those neighborhoods. And the reason you're able to get the returns in those neighborhoods is because they do have risk. But a lot of where you might be able to capitalize on in Fair Park is people do own these generational assets and they start getting deferred maintenance, they start getting behind on taxes, and they need a capital infusion to get that asset up to a nice condition again. So where I'm seeing investors work in Fair Park is they'll go in and purchase these assets from the homeowner and rent it back to them and they will revitalize that property and give them a good place to live in again and they will rent it back to them at a fair rate. Alternatives to that is to purchase it from them, uh, inject capital into it, and then owner finance it back to them. So where you start talking about small dollar IRAs, we're talking about that $50,000 person. We can go in there as a real estate investor, acquire the asset, uh, revitalize the asset, owner finance it back to them using a small dollar IRA. They give that IRA 8 to 10% on it, and then I turn around and sell it with a wrap, and I can collect the yield spread off the note. So there's, there's your money. Go talk with Chris. Within the family and let, let them stay there. You can, they, they want a nice place to live. They want, you know, all of these things. Well, I can go in there, secure the asset, and make sure that they're capable of, of, of renting it back from me. I can clean it up for them, and then I can turn around and sell it back to them with profit built in on a note. I can create first and second lien positions. I can do several different things there with the note, and I can start selling it off, create cash flow, create capital junk, chunks. There's all different kinds of strategies that can be employed there, and you will find small dollar IRAs that are looking for long-term cap. And so there's, 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 there's those plays on those. Gentlemen, thank you for taking the time and sharing your knowledge. Uh, I'm sure everybody here is uh, going to be uh, much better off starting tonight. Uh, question for you, Daniel. Um, uh, I, you know, I used to do a lot of stuff manually before as far as trying to look for pre-foreclosures and stuff like that. Uh, but ever since I started subscribing to Propelio, my business has, I'm, I'm closing about probably 10 to 12 times more deals subscribing to your list. So thank you for, very much for, for coming out with the Propelio uh, and, and what you do at, at, with Propelio. Thank you so much. Question for you is, you do such a great job with the residential list. Why don't you do the same with the commercial? My answer to that was just not having the confidence. Like, like I've, I've, I'll openly admit that um, it scared me. The very first time I signed a million dollar something was frightening to me. Like I was looking at life in prison at 19. I have the equivalent of a sixth grade education. And where I'm at today, I am still unaware of where I'm at. Like I see all of this going on around me and it doesn't click in my head that I am a part of it. So my confidence was not there. And then whenever I started growing the confidence on the commercial side, I had achieved success in several different areas and I got very opportunity rich and time poor. So I had to learn where I was gonna focus my time and 
and it has came down to propel you. Like I have commercial assets, I have cash flow on that side, but where is my end game? And my end game is Propelio. It is paying back to everybody in this crowd where I came from. Where I came from was not wealth. Where I came from was not anything other than death, drugs, and, and you know that was my life. That's where I was going to be. And I see my family failing. I see my family in those traps. I see the people that kept me alive in those traps. And if I can provide this knowledge to y'all to get out of those traps, that's where I'm at now. That's where my passion is. I don't need real estate right now because my excitement is seeing others win. Just like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and your story actually is, is so powerful that a lot of people who, who uh, are subscribers to Propel Your List uh, believe in you and your story. Uh, my, my, my question specifically, though, however, is you're already giving us the list for, for the residential pre-foreclosures, the probates, the affidavit of airships, and all that stuff. I'm, t I'm asking, why are you not including commercial properties in that list? Do you want to know why I sold those lists? I was, I was heavy in the game around 2015, 16, and I get, once again became at competing focus, Propelio or real estate. And I was like looking at my portfolio, where was I making all my money? I was making it in the rehabs. The wholesaling was just opportunities that acquired through my marketing efforts. And it, I was like, it's taking most of my time. It's providing the least amount of benefit. I'm just going to start acquiring from wholesalers and I'll continue rehabbing. Well, at that time I had a team of five virtual assistants that were keeping my business alive. They were, they are my employees. And I, if I was shutting down my wholesaling, then I was gonna have to fire my, my VAs and my VAs kept me alive. And I felt horrible letting them go because I was going on to bigger and better things. So the only reason those ever became a part of Propelio was because I did not want to fire my VAs and they were already trained on how to uh, source all of this. And I was like, why don't I just pass that benefit off to, to the Propelio users? So we, we build our, all of our own lists in house through a team of virtual assistants. Hi, this is for you as well, Daniel. Um, I, I value all of you on the panel, but I came from North Carolina to see you guys, all of you. Um, Troy is a really good friend of ours. I was exposed to Propelio about four months ago through the kingdom, and uh, you are a daily part of our world. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, daily. So um, when we saw this event, I was like, hands down, we're coming, yeah. But I was a correctional nurse as well for many years, and I love that one of my guys, and I consider you one of my guys, made it. I mean, that is beautiful. So, guys, this is... <laughs> because I got to go home every day, and you did not, okay? So when you walked out those doors for the last time, that is, like, precious to me. But one of my biggest fears is... I, I have a plethora of properties, and I can trade them all in and do something bigger, but I'm a little scared. How do you get over that fear? Seeing the end game. I mean, like, do you like what you have right now? And everything is not about money. Everything is not about bigger and better, and that has been one of the biggest things that has had to hit me in the last year and a half because, you know, the 80 hour weeks, 100 hour weeks to get this off of the ground came at a massive cost. Like, you know, I'm, I'm looking, I was looking at, at almost a divorce. My, I was an absentee father to my daughter. And if you can see the words tattooed down the side of my leg, it says abandoned. And like, that was killing me. It was like, I'm having to leave my daughter every day. And I know what it felt like to be abandoned as a child. And it's like, I'm not going to be that father. So, like, I had to make a choice. It's like my net worth or my family. And it, it's just like it's going to be my family. I'm not going to do anything else. And then having to learn how to shift to adjust to accommodate that was hard because I had a team of people around me. I had a team of investors around me. And I had to tell them it's like it, my family is first. I can't say my family is first and not live like my family is first. So. Where do you want to be? Where is your vision? And if your vision is not where you're at right now, then let's look further down into the future. And then you have to embrace what that future is going to look like. And do you want that future bad enough to make the changes? And 
what I tell everybody is your, your, your why has to be larger than your fear. And like, if you're comfortable right now, honestly, you're not going to be the one that's going to go out there and grind past it because it's going to be a grind. It's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have to get into positions that you would not want to be in. And that only comes through a why that is larger than your fear. So you're going to have to decide, is that what you want to do? And I mean, I'm always for going bigger, but at what cost? And just make sure that there's balance to that life. And I'm sure that these guys have a lot to say about that. Do you guys have something else you'd like to add to that? I'd, I'd like to hear it. Um, so my response is, is having gone through where I put it all on the table and I lost, um, I understand that fear wholeheartedly. Um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't smart enough in our first capital group to pump the brakes and back off. So I lost a relationship because of that but I still have two great kids from that relationship that now are like priority. Um, so with the fact that they're a priority, it shifted, you know, I, I'm the guy that took a, somebody, like God needed a two by four to get my attention. Daniel, he didn't necessarily need a two by four because he picked up on it a lot faster than I did. But I'm, I'm okay with that. And I, and I took my losses, I took my bumps, and I just rebuilt an entire new business in a different direction. And I did it because I didn't want to be away from my kids. And, you know, my oldest is, uh, he graduates high school in two, two weeks. Um, he's gone into more of a vocational school where he loves welding and fabricating. That's like his thing. So, um, so I've got to see that because I traded, you know, those 80 to 100 hour work weeks um, you know, there was one point where I was, I was home for like eight days in like 75 day time period. I was literally like coming home, dumping out my clothes, grabbing a new suitcase and then leaving again. And I was traveling all over the world. And although it sounds luxurious and it sounds awesome when you're flying first class and you, and you show up in Paris and you throw up a selfie and you do this and you do that, behind the scenes it's, it, it can get to be a nightmare if, you, if you're not balanced. And I'm not saying you don't shoot for the moon. I'm, I'm not saying like Corey's dad's, you know, you know, swing for the fences. Absolutely swing for the fences. But understand what you're swinging for the fences for. You know, is it for money? Mm, I don't know that that's necessarily a healthy thing to go for. I think if you go for your passion, for what's going to benefit you, what's going to create the lifestyle that you want, what's going to incorporate your family in on it, then I think you're going to have the best success there because you're going to have that hometown team at home and they're going to be your biggest cheerleaders. They're going to be your biggest advocates because when you go outside and you get knocked down and you will get knocked down, you'll lose money on a deal. You'll have an investor not follow through. You'll have somebody steal your deal from you. You know, you'll have capital that all of a sudden disappears. You know, all of that is just a reality to it. You want to make sure you've got that hometown team going on and that they understand what you're doing, and that you're playing for them at the end of the day. And if you can build that, then you know, th there's nothing stopping you from going to that next level at the end of the day. Thank you, Troy. I spend a lot of my time showing people financial modeling, teaching them how to utilize capital without inordinate risk. I'll be 60 years old in November. This cowboy ain't fixing to sign a big note. Ain't gonna happen. I got a note on my house and a note probably on my car, and I got no other notes that I've personally guaranteed that's gonna break my back. Now, I don't mean that investors aren't gonna get their money back, but I'm just saying to you, structuring financing in a way that does not uh, topple your load at the market craters and that kind of thing. That's what's giving you fear. And I'm saying to you, that's a fair fear. Learn how to deal with it and realize that maybe there's a way to structure financing where you don't have to take an ordinate risk. I believe you're in an, an incredible opportunistic market. I train a lot of real estate investors that buy over 100 houses a year, creative financing techniques that they have no personal guarantee on. It can be done if you're creative. Thank you. Uh, yeah, what he said. 
what he said. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, for your right. time. What, what I'm looking to find out is um, at what point did each of you come from nothing to hiring employees? Um, I a, was a general contractor from 2003 to 2015, went from small-time handyman contractor, general contractor, to having about four crews running underneath me, and that's where my peak point was. Um, I went to Armando Montelongo, learned some real estate, put a lot of money into that, um, got my money back out of it, but I did it all by myself, and I'm used to um, coordinating everybody. I'm used to making everybody work so the team gets to the final goal, and I'm not sure with all the different positions as far as disposition, acquisition, sales, uh, at what point do I try and hire on these people? Fast as possible, as quickly as I can produce capital for them, basically? My biggest, my biggest problem on the real estate side was running as a lone wolf. Like, I, I say that, that there's benefits and drawbacks to that, but the hindrance to that was I was working 100 hour weeks because I understood so much of the business and I am not, I generally am not good at managing people. I, I, I function solely within, within the house. Uh, it wasn't until Propelio came about that I actually really started bringing people on as a team because I had zero clue how to run a software company. Like sixth grade education, software company, I had to have partners and then I had to put people in place that could do all the things that I had no clue how to do. And that's where I really started scaling. But on the wholesaling side, now that I've learned the I've learned, I'm learning, I'm not even, I'm not even say I've learned, I'm learning the business side of things. Uh, if I would have applied that knowledge to the real estate side of things, I could have really blew it up. So I would say the second that you can automate and systematize, put somebody in place to handle that for you because your job is to grow your team, coach your team, and keep your team performing at top notch. So the fastest you can do that, the better your life's going to be. My caveat to that is, um, you know, you probably can do it with less people than you think, right? Um, and, you know, but yeah, I mean, most of the guys that I know that are doing really big businesses in wholesaling are actually scaling down and looking to analyze their, their numbers and their conversions. So the, the biggest profit ability in wholesaling is your closing conversions. If you can fix that number, you can be way more successful than fixing all the other things that could that you can mess with. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with uh, everything these gentlemen are saying. It's not as big of a hurdle as you're making it out to be. And if I was to hire one person to start a team, I would hire somebody in the marketing side. That's where I would start. And I would, and I would it sounds like you've got the contracting side and all that kind of oh, yeah. already dialed in, so that's not something that you need to worry about. But if you can hire somebody in the marketing side, where it be a VA or use Propelio's model or you know whatever's out there that you can embrace, then they can bring in leads and you would have the responsibility of closing them. Now that becomes your responsibility, but the more you close, the more you make, and then you can add that side of the team. Marketing is is the number one thing you need to put money into when you're running the business and growing your business. And you can get it through a lot of different ways, websites, leads, all that kind of fun stuff. But, yeah. Thank you, Propelio, for the website, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to add something on to that. And you mentioned wholesaling, man. If you've got a general contracting background, I would completely 10,000% ignore wholesaling. That is, that is going to be detriment to you, not an advantage. You, as a remodeler, as a contractor, you have the experience you need to knock some rehabs down and do it at a cost that is competitive in this market. You should not be wholesaling. My, my opinion is right now you should be working in this room and working in this venue and finding all of these wholesalers and then finding private capital and then placing the private capital, getting those wholesalers to source deals for you and then utilize your skills. Your skills is in the rehabbing side of it. Your skills yeah. is in the general contracting side of it. You have two things you're missing. You're missing a network of wholesalers and you're missing a network of private capital, both of which you could find at this event. 
put those two things down and just stay in your lane. You're a general contractor, nothing wrong with that, and you can make massive amounts of money as a general contractor on the investor side versus working for the investor, and that's where I'd recommend you go. Don't learn a whole new trade. You've already got one nailed. Okay, so all the, all the employees I just listed off for, for wholesaling, correct? Because that's, that's my focus is on flipping. That's, that's what I want to do. I, don't do. I wouldn't do any wholesaling. You do not need to be a wholesaler. So don't you even have, push my leads off to, to people with buyer's list, to other wholesalers. Don't even mess with it. You have a trade acquired. Apply that trade to creating wealth. Don't go out and try and learn a whole new trade. You already have a trade that can generate wealth for you. You understand remodeling houses. You have a crew of people, which means you can take this asset down and remodel it at a cost cheaper than the average person out there. So when somebody's offering a 78 cent rehab or an 82 cent rehab, your crew, your connections can actually pull that down to a safer 74, 75% deal. And that 5% the extra you're paying as the risk, you know, everybody says 70 cents. Well, you're coming in at 75 cents. Just chalk that five cents up to the marketing fee. Yeah. So you don't, you, all you need capital and you need wholesalers. Build those networks out and skip wholesaling totally. You're, you're trying to create a business around something that you don't need to create it around. So okay. let, me, let me see if I can give you a little perspective here. I sold a company in September that flipped over 100 houses a year for the last six years. And I can tell you right now, I would not want to do that ever again. Ever again. And I, yeah, you can hire employees. The, the one thing I would recommend is immediately going into either an Airbnb model or a buy and hold. Completely skip wholesaling, completely skip flipping. Just the tax advantages alone, it just doesn't even make sense, especially with the, you guys saw the market update, the massive amount of appreciation we're experiencing over 12 and 24 months. I would completely skip all those models and go right into buy and hold real estate. And that makes you, that gives you an extreme advantage, especially on the rehabbing side. Um, and I can tell you what, I mean, if you really want to build that business, you run on about a 50% margin. If your deal flow is consistent for about one quarter, then you start hiring people. That's really what it comes down to. But I've, I've owned that company. I sold that company to my business partner. I never want to do it again. You are begging for 80 and 90 hour work weeks. If that's what you want to do, great. No, you don't want to do that. Okay, great. So I really would look at more buy and hold. And Daniel's right. There's a ton of people. You can buy all the deals you want here. You can get all the private money you want here. Now, the challenge is going to be you're going to need some more bodies somewhere. Now, you're a great GC, right? Guess what? You don't get to be a GC anymore. Bad news, you don't get to be a GC anymore. Somebody else, you're going to have to hire. You may be the best GC. You now need to hire the second best GC to replace you because you need to be sitting in this room every single day or on Facebook or wherever looking for deals and looking for money. It's got to be you. can't be somebody else. So you're going to have to hire. That's who you're going to have to hire out. You're going to have to replace yourself as the GC. That would be the first person I'd hire. My two cents. Something Thank that you. Troy was talking about yesterday was I think you were saying the 532 model. So if you're out there, you're going to need to do the Airbnbs and the buy and hold. You're going to need the cash to continue acquiring. And I don't know what your cash position is right now. But one of the things that Troy was saying the other day, out of the five you buy, flip three of them, hold two. And then you can start building up your B&Bs. But you don't have to do that. You can raise 100% private money. See, there you go. All that See, money's right. here. I'm telling you, we do 100% private money for most of our stuff. It's all right here. You already figured out this 50 million. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's You know the cheapest private, private money? You know, the cheapest private money of all has no, no personal guarantee on it. What's that? It's when you buy and get the seller to finance for you. That money, that money is, that's wholesale money. That's not a wholesale price. That's wholesale financing that lets you control a deal at a super cheap price. That's creative financing. You can crush it doing that. And so it's a different way of thinking, but it is definitely... If you look at all of the fix and flip and the wholesale models out there, there's strategies you can go buy a house that they'd never even go look at that will make you upfront profit and income for a long time in the future, right? So as far as your question about employees, it's all a matter of this. Everybody up here does something every day that's worth $20 an hour. We don't want to admit it, but we really do it. And everybody up here does something that is worth two thousand dollars an hour so the smartest guy is the guy that figures out how to spend more of his day doing something worth two thousand bucks an hour than twenty dollars an hour
Okay, so y'all kind of already hopped around my question a little bit, but being a little more direct. So you get the private uh, capital from people that you know or people that you've met. Knowing what you know now, where would you put it? I know a lot of people like start out just Probably rehabbing or doing the owner financing. Would you go They're going to buy more nodes. <laughs> I'm going to buy more apartments. At least I'm buying apartments. That's what I'm doing. I'm just going to buy apartments. That's what I know. That's what I'm good at. Um, and listen, so here's probably what's unique about all of us is if you ask us, we're probably really good at like one little thing. And when it comes down, I buy 70s and 80s apartment buildings. People say, Corey, you want to develop a, a property? No. Why? I have no idea how to develop a property. But I know how to buy old broken crap all day long, right? Yeah. And I can fix it. Um, so that's my niche. And I stay in my, and I do student housing. Those are the two things that I do, student housing, 70s and 80s buildings, that's it. That's all I'm, that's all I'm good at. That's it. you got to know your niche, right? I mean, I've done this a long time. I've done it a lot of different ways, but I have certain fixed ideas about, and my fixed ideas today, I believe, are what the market is telling me that's relevant. And so there's things that I could have done 15 years ago that may not work today, and like you're trying to go figure out what do you go invest in and stuff. And I'd say the best answer to you is you got to go figure out where the opportunities are, right? And then you can draw some conclusions. I could, I could get the whiteboard out and show you some magic math, you know, and you'd say, that's really cool. But if it's not what you want to go do, it's not cool to you. Yeah. Right? It's cool to me, you know. And so uh, I, I think that's the key. You just got to go figure out what you want your niche to be because that's what we figured out. Um, I would start off by saying what you focus on expands at the end of the day. And each of us have a different niche. And the reason we're successful in that niche is we stay focused on that niche. So somebody may come along to Eddie or me and say, you know, I can't find a single note anywhere. And Eddie and I are like, man, they're falling from the sky. There's like a hailstorm going on with notes right now. And yet they don't see the same thing, but that's because that's what Eddie and I focus on. Same thing with Corey focusing on, you know, apartment complexes. That's what his niche is. That's what his, his baby is. Same thing um, with Daniel and his, you know, mobile homes. Find your, find your deal and focus on that. Then the world will start to open up. Believe it or not, the universe will answer your question every single day. And don't let other people talk you out of doing something else. Like people come to me and like, hey, Troy, you want a rental property? I'm like, hell no, I don't want a rental property. And then, hey, it makes great cash flow. It's got an ROI of, I mean, I, it doesn't matter. It just, it makes no, no thank you. No, I don't care if it's the house next to me. The answer is still no. And, and it's not because I, I'm anti-rental. It's because it pulls me off point. My success is here. And the person, you know, somebody could come along right next to me and, and eat that up and go, man, you lost out on a great deal. And I'm like, congratulations on your deal. Dude, isn't it when you have money? So when you really can command money, I'm telling you, there's white rabbits that come everywhere. They're like, ooh, yeah. and you can have, because, man, when we get together, like, you could come up with an idea, like, that's a great idea, man. And we could probably say, oh, hell, we could fund that thing, and it could be like, yeah. ooh. And then, but the discipline that we all have, I think, is the ability yeah. to say, no, that's not what I do. Yeah. And, no. and the reason we it have, sounds great, but it's white The rabbit. reason we have discipline is because we've chased these things down rabbit holes. Yeah. Because we didn't say no. We said yeah, yeah a lot of times. Yeah. I mean, we, we look really cool up on stage today. But trust me, five years ago, ten years ago, we were all scratching our head going, what in the world are we going to do now? And it's just that we figured it out that chasing all these different ideas, and they were great ideas, good people, great ideas, great opportunities, great cash flow, E all the above. But we had to back off. And, and part of that, we backed off because maybe we lost money. Maybe we ran into a, a dead end. Or maybe our wives slapped us upside the head and said, what are you doing? You know, it was, it was probably all of those things going on. But, but find, that, find that niche for you. Like, like he talked about Lonnie's, Lonnie deals. Lonnie, Lonnie made all of his money doing mobile homes. You know, that was, that was I mean, yeah, he made like great money doing mobile homes. You know how much money I've made off mobile homes? Nothing. The last mobile home deal I had was driving down Interstate 30 outside of Dallas, east of Dallas. So no kidding. I won't buy those deals anymore. Well, I was going to inspect the property, and all of a sudden the mobile home, like, oh, hold on a minute here. 
So I don't do those deals <laughs> anymore. So that's what I would do. I would what you focus on expands, and then and find what you want to be passionate about. Even if you start with something and it evolves, let it evolve. So it would be more something you're interested in, or is it what like the data tells you to go to necessarily? It's what you're interested in. So if you like wholesaling properties, focus on wholesaling properties. Build that up. And if you find that, okay, I've mastered this and I want to evolve into like fix and hold or fix and flip, then evolve into that. My start, I started wholesaling notes. I, I wish I still had those notes. You know, when I was wholesaling notes, the, the face rate of the note was like 18 to 19%. 30-year notes out of San Antonio, Texas. I wish I had those, ba those, those <laughs> nowadays because that's not the case nowadays. But it evolved into other things. And I started buying notes. And then I started portfolio notes. And then I started buying non-performing notes. And it's just kind of progressively grown. Don't, don't be scared to buck the trend. All right, if you ask up here today, we don't seem like we're all enamored with wholesaling, right? Yeah. I trained some of the top wholesalers in the United States. I'm, he knows that, mm -hmm. right? I teach them how to go not wholesale. Because what I'm teaching them to do is the opposite of their wholesaling, because they get leads that they can't close and they need creative financing and then they create notes out of it. And they, make, they make upfront money when they resell it on a down payment. And they make money over time. I respect the heck out of how smart they are to wholesaling, but some of those guys weren't around in 2008, and this cowboy was. And I'm telling you, those people you call to wholesale a house to, they'll disappear. Am I right? <laughs> they will disappear. And so it's, there's, there's things about it that just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's the smartest thing for you to do. Or some smartest thing for you to do exclusively. I feel like everybody on this panel has done a very good job of, of giving you the right answer, which is do where you feel like you can win. I mean, I have my strengths, you have your strengths, I have no clue. So put your money where it's at. So if you were asking me what I would do, like what this is where, if I was back starting out, and I was in today's market, and I was in this area, and I was wanting to kill it, and I hadn't secured all this yet, I would likely be looking at purchasing 10 acre plus chunks, breaking them down into two acre lots, dropping mobile homes on them and selling them on notes. That is the niche that I would likely be trying to push into because I'm not a, I don't have a lot of competition in that side and it has really good strength. So like I can get, let's say I'm purchasing at 10,000 an acre and I get 10 acres, I'm into it for 100 grand and it costs me 75 to 80,000 per lot to, to build it up. Well, I'm into that lot for 90 grand and then I can drop out and sell it on the MLS for a buck 40, buck 45. I'm pulling forty thousand dollars a lot times five lots. I, 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 that's somewhere I feel like I could dominate and move fast. Like if I was if I was in an area, that's where I would likely start out right now. Like if I had to start out square square one, limited to no capital, that is likely where I would start pushing. That's me. Thanks. I'm a little taller, so I'm gonna pull this off this thing. Uh, so you guys kind of touched on this briefly on a number of different things, talking about niches, which is great. Uh, I think the question though is, um, until you try multiple things, you don't really know what your niche is. So like, I run acquisitions and dispositions for a wholesale business with my buddy Brian. Um, it was his company and he's hired me within the last six months to, to take over those things. Our, our dream, our goal is to kind of push into rehabs, push into buy and holds, you know, push into multi multifamily stuff because we do a lot of wholesaling on single family deals. So originally he was like, go up there and ask Corey this question about where to find, sorry, I just threw you under the bus hard. I'm really sorry. He was like, go ask Corey, um, go, <laughs> woo, pay cut. Go ask Corey where to find these apartments at, where to find, find these multifamily deals. But then you were talking about, I mean, all of you have touched on different things that's kind of like, eh, kind of, changes the question, but I'm gonna start there and just saying as far as growing a business, I mean, in my opinion, you said do what you can win at, Daniel's what you said, what if you can win at multiple things? I guess I'm just trying to understand, I'm not trying to be right. cocky, I'm just asking a question, right. like, I'm gonna so, shut up. Yeah, so 
my biggest challenge to everybody out there, I believe this wholeheartedly, you should be owning more stuff to keep for yourself, right? That's just, o overall, a lot of us could do it. Well, sometimes that those real nice choice flips are probably ones or wholesales, probably ones you should keep and rent, right? Just saying, right? But for apartments, apartments is a very easy game um, as far as getting deal flow, right? Where do I do deals? The Midwest and the South. And that's a big region, right? But you could say Texas and Oklahoma, right? And all the little small cities. And then you go to loopnet.com, right? And you search for apartments in those cities, right? And you'll subscribe to every broker's list. And these brokers will send you their deals. Most times, all the deals that I buy are on, not, they all say they're off market, right? Oh, I got this off market deal, right? They're not. Right, but like, but whatever. So, and then you just have to do the work to underwrite them, right? And when you find the right deal uh, that makes sense, that calculates, that's what you do. Last year we did 723 underwritings. I bought six. Kiss a lot of frogs. Well. You are exactly in a business that I would be confident that I could help you with because you're a wholesaler. What happens when the house doesn't have any equity? They owe 260000 and it's only worth three hundred. Do you go right and look at it? I can show you how to crush it with that deal. What happens when a house is free and clear? Okay? And I can show you how to buy it on terms that no other lender would ever agree to. That's called the seller of the property, right? So you're passing deals every day there's opportunity in because you're taught a strategy which you've become very good at called buy low, sell high. That is one half of the equation. So if you're asking me, you're already in a niche that you've, you're already, but you're only filling half the box up. I think that, that's a problem that we've run into. We've talked to, we've brainstormed some different ideas of, of what I, to do. So well, trust me of the top 500 guys in this business, about 150 or 200 of them learn what I teach. Well, I got five I, bucks. I, I, Let's I know, get coffee. I know how to fix it. You know, and I'm, and I'm not, I'm not saying that braggadociously. These guys know, I mean, I'm just saying I've been a note guy for 40 years. I've learned creative financing. But you're asking me about a niche that I say that you're not harvesting the, you're only harvesting half the field, probably. Make sense? Yeah, I would have to agree with Eddie there. I don't think it's, oftentimes when we get into a niche and we get into a groove, and if it starts to slow down or dry up or maybe the numbers starts to taper off, our, our natural instinct is to jerk the wheel and go off on another path, you know, and, and rightfully so. I mean, there's a lot of different, I say, niches in our business. But, you know, years ago when, you know, when I was in the performing notes space, we started buying non-performing notes before it became new, even before the market crashed, because we could see what was happening. And we just evolved into that, you know, I say naturally as a whole. I didn't jump into wholesaling. I didn't start buying this and doing that because the market was going to change. I just stayed in my lane. So what Eddie's saying, I, I would endorse it 100% by, you know, take what you've got there, take those leads that are falling, how do you say, off the desk or into the trash can, and go back and look at those and see which ones can actually be bought, bought with different terms, different options, different methodologies. And that'll put you head and shoulders above your competition. And it'll down your marketing costs and increase your closings and increase your revenue and, and build your generational wealth model. So you guys are good at what you do. You've spent a lot of time, money, and hours perfecting what you're doing. You know, it's, it's uh, I like to use the example of, uh, of uh, Michael Jordan. He was phenomenal at playing basketball, but he really wanted to go play baseball. And so he took off on that year-long journey to go play baseball. He was okay at playing baseball. He was no, you know, what was it, uh, what was his, uh, the other guy, Bo, whatever his name was, uh, Bo Jackson. You know, Bo was a guy who could play two different sports very good. That's, that's the exception to the rule. So I would just, you know, be like Michael Jordan, stay in your lane, just get really good at it. 
and, and just you know, approach it from a different perspective. You'll be a lot happier. You'll be a lot happier. Yet again, I have to resonate. One of the things they said, you're saying, you know, like, we go out and do this, 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 and this, and I'm not trying to be cocky, but I feel like we can win at all that. And my, 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 per, my, my take on that 10 years ago was you're right. My take on this today is you're wrong. You're not going to do 12 things well. You really need to focus in, find the one thing that you feel like you can dominate in and just focus. Because if you don't, you're going to get spread thin and it's not going to work out well for you. The advice that the panel has given is great. Um, subject to wraps, owner financing, creative note structuring terms. Terms buying is where I did a lot of my deals. Um, there's a strong niche in that. You need to learn it. If you're creating the marketing that's creating the leads and you're giving half of them away because they're not high equity, then you've done yourself a disservice by not monopolizing on those. Underwater houses, you've got, you've got Melody Medley next door. She can short all day long. I did close to $300,000 just in shorts in 2015 because of Melody. Those were properties that were way underwater. Boom, toss the lead off to her, I get it back. I was bringing in more leads than Net Worth or New Western both, and I was shorting them. I was just shorting them, shorting them, shorting them. And Melody's just killing me for killing, killing it for me. And then you add in subject two. I didn't understand subject two. I didn't understand wraps. And I'm sitting here looking at that as an opportunity lost. I'm spending the fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a month in marketing. I'm not capitalizing on it. I found out about Grant Kemp. I, for, I found out about uh, Happy House Buyers. And I'm like, y'all guys are killing it in the sub two rap game. What can I do to learn that from you? I ended up partnering up with Grant, and Grant taught me the sub two game. And there now I'm capitalizing every single lead I got. I've got. I've got retail leads that I'm working with real estate agents on. I've got upside down properties that I'm working with Melody over at Oye's on. I've got, you know, these, these deals that are kind of thin, but there's still opportunity there. Sub two, Grant, boom, all day long. So just take what you're doing and just monopolize on it. Uh, real quick, I just want to point out that I'm going to lift this up because I'm uncomfortable. Uh, we got people from North Carolina. We got people from Atlanta, New York. Uh, Phoenix, uh, anybody else in the crowd? Cool, all DFW, what? Irving, Irving. that's far. <laughs> all over Texas, you know, you got Houston, San Antonio, Austin. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to shout that out to you people. You people, that sounds bad. Uh, I got a question from Gregory Ballard out in Houston. Uh, how do you approach your family members who have money? Is it ever uncomfortable? That's the first or the you, second question would be, should you? The first people you should ask is your family. Listen, they make great practice uh, test, test uh, you know, subjects. They'll always forgive you when you screw it up, right? But listen, if you use my approach, which is you never ask people for money, you only ask them who they know, it's really that whole approach, right? Because the right people will self-select. So believe it or not, when most of us are doing a business, we are not selling um, we, are, we, we have opportunities that we're soliciting if they're interested or not, right? And, and when you put it that way, it, it takes a lot of the, hey, listen, it's pass or play. I don't give a rip, right? Because someone else will. So, you know. I don't think family's any different than anybody else. I mean, you're, you're talking about your business. You're, you're giving them examples of deals. You show them how it works. You're not... You're not asking them for money at the end of the day. Corey's advice and that is absolutely correct. So, you know, I mean, family or otherwise, you're just talking about here's what I do and here's what I'm doing. And, you know, it's, it's family or non-family. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, I mean, family is no different than anybody else. I mean, I, I manage my parents' money and we put a lot of notes under with their capital that we are building up their retirement fund. Um, but when I do that, I have a very good understanding of what their risk tolerance is. And so I put very, very safe, very vanilla deals, high equity things I use their money on. And I put it in their portfolio. Um, and it's a kind of a two-prong approach. One is it helps them, but also I know I'm gonna inherit it anyway, so it's, <laughs> so it's not like I eventually won't get it. So. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to mess up Thanksgiving dinner. I want to keep getting invited for Christmas. And so I understand what their, what their risk tolerance is. There are some family members in my family that you, you couldn't give me two cents of their money because they're just, they would be a pain. 
and, and you approach it like any other investor. Um, I mean, I love all my family members, but I, I, sometimes I love them keeping their money, and I'll keep my money, I'll do my thing, and they do their thing. So that's the way I would look at it. I'm going to be the only one that disagrees on this one, and that is, like, I'm not cash hungry. Like, I've got capital available to me that, that I can put on the streets, and while I may have family members that would like to invest with me, I would much rather Thanksgiving and Christmas to not be about business. I don't want my family constantly hitting me up trying to get me in business. I, I am, I am, when I go home, I want, I want to be home. So my advice on that from my side is like, hey, if they're wanting to place capital and I've got people like these people up here on the panel that I know have proven track records of placing capital, I would much rather just tell my family members, it's like, hey man, I'd much rather we stay family and you just place this capital with other people that I have faith in so that way we can just stay family and I, I, I stay completely out of it. All right, we got any other final questions? Let's, oh, one more, all right. You're the last one. Make it good. <laughs> Got a lot to live up to. So for the No Bear guys, um, can you give us kind of a 30,000-foot overview of creative financing and how you use note buying in uh, cooperation with uh, flipping and also long-term holds? <laughs> no. You have a you, you, you got a you got a customer that owns a house. Let's just take a free and clear to make a s simplest example, right? You have a house that's free and clear. It costs a hundred grand, right? Retails a hundred grand. Everybody else is trying to buy it for seventy-five, right? They won't sell for seventy. different than what a lender would normally require, right? So let's just say they wanted 20000 at the closing. And you said, I don't want to pay 20000 at the closing. I, only I want to pay nothing at the closing. We'll create a $20,000... You do a short term first, long term second, where this where the rates kick in. So you're saying, I mean, there's a there's totally a nothing down deal that got them twenty closing and got the price that nobody else would pay. So Eddie kind of answered the first, you know, the 